Good afternoon, and welcome to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. My name is Dan Gorodnik, and I have the privilege of chairing this hearing. I'm so pleased that we are joined today uh, by Council Members Adams, Borelli, and Kozlowitz. And uh, to Council Member Adams, we welcome you uh, to the committee. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, and of course, always good to see uh, Council Members Borelli and Kozlowitz. Um, for some time now, New York City residents have been noticing an uptick in the number of empty storefronts along of our streets. A favorite restaurant disappears here, a beloved small clothing shop there, and they are replaced by nothing. In many cases, businesses that have been at a location for decades are suddenly gone, with only a sign in the window, lost our lease, and then eventually store for rent. As the number of vacant storefronts has gone up and up, we have all become more and more alarmed. The growing number of vacancies drains vitality from our neighborhoods and reduces the number of local jobs. And these vacancies are everywhere, though the problem is particularly acute in Manhattan and in some of our city's most commercially desirable high-traffic neighborhoods. Along Manhattan's 14th Street, a study last summer by Vacant New York found a third of storefronts shuttered. State Senator Brad Hoylman's examination of Bleecker Street found that it had a nearly 20 percent vacancy rate. And an analysis by Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer found 200 empty storefronts along Broadway. So the question becomes, what's going on? We've heard of many businesses closing when their rents were increased by three, four, five times what they were paying previously. That phenomenon acquired the moniker of high rent blight. We are seeing storefronts that had housed high-end boutiques, which had displaced local businesses and are now themselves gone. Yet now many storefronts have been vacant for too many months, making it obvious that stratospheric rents are no longer an option and raising the question of why landlords would continue to hold such spaces vacant rather than lowering rents and attracting new tenants. What are the factors that motivate the owners of these spaces, and what can we do to change that incentive structure? We've also heard about the challenges that the retail sector faces quite apart from commercial rents. Online shopping has taken a real toll on brick-and-mortar businesses as more and more people prefer to do their shopping from home. The retail sector is in a transitional moment, as companies that traditionally have relied on selling physical goods to customers in a physical space are forced to reconsider their business models. Macy's, an iconic New York City retailer, announced earlier this year that it was closing 63 stores nationwide and cutting 10,000 jobs. While these were not necessarily New York City stores and jobs, it is an indicator of the difficulties faced by the sector more broadly. As a city, we need to understand the forces driving the retail vacancy crisis so that we can craft solutions that will improve our local economy and our quality of life. Today, the City Council released a report with a number of recommendations aimed at supporting struggling small businesses and at developing new ones. With New York City's strong economy and unique character depending on these neighborhood shops, it is critical that we continue to push forward with other efforts. Some of the recommendations include establishing the Department of Small Business Services as the point agency for dealing with the vacancy crisis, improved data collection on vacancies, adjusting land use policy and creating financial incentives to facilitate renting out spaces. As this report indicates, the retail vacancy crisis will require a raft of policy approaches, potentially. No one silver bullet will likely fix this problem. Our recent reform of the commercial rent tax is a start, reducing taxes on nearly 3,000 small businesses in Manhattan. But we need to keep thinking creatively about this. That's why, as my last uh, hearing as chair of this committee and 
likely the last committee that I'll be chairing as a member of the City Council. I'm very pleased that this is the subject that we are going to take on. And I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone who is here to testify on this important issue. I want to thank committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, and Policy Analyst Nadia Johnson for their work in putting this hearing together. Uh, and um, with that, we're going to turn it over to the Department of Finance and the Department of uh, Small Business Services. And uh, if you all can uh, introduce yourselves, we are, we are ready to, to hear from you. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, Chair Gorodnik and members of the Committee on Economic Development. My name is Rachel Vantosh. I am the Deputy Commissioner of Business Services at the New York City Department of Small Business Services, or SBS. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I'm pleased to testify on the administration's support of small businesses in New York City. I am joined by my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Blaise Bakker, and representatives from the New York City Department of Finance to answer questions. Small businesses are essential to the local economy and character of our neighborhood. They provide opportunities and jobs for members of their communities. Small business ownership and entrepreneurship can help uplift generations of families while providing neighbors with goods and services. As we all know, business owners face a myriad of challenges as they seek to operate and grow in New York City. Under Mayor de Blasio, the city has invested in reducing the burden on business owners across many different fronts. The mayor has reduced small business fines by 40%, created Small Business First, an initiative across 15 city agencies to help businesses save money and open more quickly, helped businesses connect with over $200 million in financing, including launching new loan funds to help business owners grow. Most recently, the administration worked closely with City Council to assist small businesses in Manhattan by raising the threshold for the commercial rent tax from $250,000 a year to $500,000 a year for businesses making less than $5 million. Partial benefits are available to businesses with income between $5 million and $10 million. On average, 2,700 small businesses will save $13,000 a year due to the leadership of City Council and Mayor de Blasio. This change will help small businesses save more money to renovate, expand, and hire new employees. Although we are proud of these accomplishments, there's always more to be done. Today we're here to discuss storefront vacancy, an important issue for both the administration and City Council. There have been many reports and studies about this topic, but perhaps the key takeaway from the research is that the underlying causes of vacancy are complex and vary from neighborhood to neighborhood, corridor to corridor, and property to property. These causes include everything from the rise of e-commerce, a new international trend, to landlord speculation, to businesses not keeping up with changing clientele, to neighborhood divestment. In the face of this, the administration has tried multiple strategies to better understand and address storefront vacancies. First, as mentioned, the city has committed significant resources to help small businesses be competitive in New York City, better ensuring their chances of growth. This fiscal year, SBS alone served nearly 10,000 entrepreneurs, connecting them with services citywide. We've also made a concerted effort to bring city services to communities through council-supported programs such as Chamber on the Go, which has reached over 7,000 businesses to date. Also in partnership with City Council, SBS has sought to combat commercial tenant harassment and unequal commercial leases, two potential causes of storefront vacancy. SBS provides direct assistance when commercial tenants experience issues with their landlords to empower business owners before they are pushed out. SBS offers commercial lease education workshops to help business owners better understand the components and implications of signing a commercial lease. After developing an understanding of lease negotiations, businesses in the process of signing a lease can use SBS's legal assistance services. 
This initiative connects business owners with pro bono attorneys who will review the business's lease and point out any concerns that should be addressed. These services, along with Councilmember Carnegie's commercial tenant harassment legislation, show the city's commitment to correcting the power imbalance between small business tenants and landlords. Since launching our commercial lease workshops, we've served over 500 businesses. By talking to business owners and reviewing actual leases, we hope to not only address an acute business issue, but get additional information on practices perpetrated by predatory landlords to push out commercial tenants. This ranges from hidden clauses and leases to landlords shutting off water and changing locks. We'll be analyzing this data and would like to work with council to develop long-term solutions to these issues. In addition to landlord-tenant tensions, another potential cause of storefront vacancy is that existing businesses are unable to adapt to neighborhood change and are therefore no longer a viable business in their existing space. The city is working to combat this issue and preserve long-standing legacy businesses through a new program called Love Your Local. This program celebrates and promotes the diverse, independent small businesses that enrich neighborhoods across New York City and encourages New Yorkers to share their favorite non-franchise businesses on an interactive online map. These businesses are also able to apply for business advisory services and funding to help their business continue to succeed. Eligible businesses may receive a grant of up to $90,000, which can be used to address operational and capital improvements, as well as other needs that will help them better compete. Through this program, SBS hopes to empower business owners to adapt to changing environments. Love Your Local will also allow SBS to test interventions to help businesses remain competitive and scale up successful strategies through integration with our business solution centers, local community groups, and other partners. Just as the issue of vacant storefronts is complex and localized, so are the solutions. Along with empowering individual businesses, we also believe it's important to empower communities to understand and combat the impacts of changing neighborhoods. One way we have empowered communities is by providing funding and technical assistance to local nonprofit organizations that are focused on supporting and improving their commercial districts, such as local development corporations, business improvement districts, merchants associations, and chambers of commerce. Via competitive grant programs such as Avenue NYC, Neighborhood Challenge, and Neighborhood 360, SBS has provided operating support to these organizations to assess the challenges faced in their districts and to implement localized solutions. For example, SBS has provided grants to organizations taking on business attraction and retention activities that include conducting local market analysis and retail leakage assessments, gathering a baseline inventory of area businesses and storefronts, determining local resident preferences via consumer surveys, creating marketing collateral for use by local property owners and retail brokers, coordinating events for brokers or potential retailers to show showcase storefront vacancies, conducting door-to-door -door merchant outreach to assess the need for lease negotiation assistance, and any number of other marketing campaigns, events, or promotions that help to boost local foot traffic and promote commercial activity. These types of activities have empowered organizations with the resources to experiment with solutions <coughs> at relatively low cost in a manner that is most responsive to the neighborhood's particular challenge. SBS and the administration are committed to understanding and tackling the complex local issues causing storefront vacancies. We hope to continue to work with council to develop solutions. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, we appreciate uh, your testimony, and we appreciate your being here today. And um, uh, I, uh, I'm going to I'm going to start off. I'm going to challenge you just a little bit on some of what you said. Um, most importantly, the hearing today is about the economic impact of vacant storefronts. And what I heard in the testimony was mostly a variety of things that SBS has done to try to help businesses over time. But I, I didn't really hear a whole lot of urgency uh, in your testimony about the problem. So the first question I would ask is, 
do, do you accept that we are in a uh, retail crisis in New York City today? Yeah, if the administration agrees that vacancy is an issue, for sure, and a very important one. One of the challenges that we have is really measuring the impact that this is having across the city. Um, you know, we don't have um, scalable ways to collect data on storefront vacancy right now, including not just counting, but understanding all of the underlying causes. And it is something that we have been discussing ways to better understand, and we're happy to work with council on that. The, the stats that we have suggest that, at least in Manhattan, over the past five years, vacancies have gone up from 2.1% to 4.2%. Um, do you accept those numbers <clears throat> as accurate? I think that there are lots of studies in Manhattan. I think what we're interested in is the citywide Numbers okay, I'm interested in that too. Let's just mm -hmm. start. Let's start with this one for a second. Then we, you can tell us what you know about the citywide. Uh, tell us about the vacancy, the, the vacancy numbers that you accept at least uh, for Manhattan over the past five years. And then I, I'd like to talk about it citywide too. I mean, thank you for the question. I think at SBS we would look to reports like you have mentioned, Department of Finance. I don't know if you have any additional information on the topic. Hi, Sheila Feinberg uh, with the Department of Finance. Um, you know, I think we would just look at the data again. I think one of the issues with this uh, is that we're trying to collect different different sources of data and trying to come up with a complete number, but we don't have that just yet. So we would want to, I, I know that you just released your report. Um, we have to take a closer look at it before we can confirm every, anything in it. So uh, the city today has no way of measuring itself the number of vacant storefronts. Is that accurate? We've had some success with localized solutions since we believe this is a localized issue. We've done commercial district needs assessments, business improvement districts provide annual reports, but we're actively looking for ways to not only understand just vacancy rates, but the underlying causes. Okay, so let's talk about those underlying causes for a second because I think that that is uh, that's really what – you want to add something? I, I would just add, yeah, I think, um, I mean, in addition to, yes, not having um, the, under, the ability to collect the data, I think there has been sort of an underlying question for us, like, um, when this data is gathered, either by the private sector or by, or by studies that have been conducted, how we define vacancy. Um, I think that's an additional challenge in regard to whether, you know, is a space – you know, visibly vacant? Do we know that the space is vacant because a property owner is holding it vacant? Is it is at least signed, but a you know build out hasn't begun? So I just think it adds another level of complexity to. What's the right way to measure that? Uh, let, let's say that we we can we can stipulate to the fact that there is a complexity there on how exactly you measure whether it's a say a good vacancy because something is about to happen that's better for a neighborhood or a bad vacancy that it's been sitting empty for two years. Uh, how how do we how do we measure that? How's, what's the right way to do that? I think that's what we're also figuring out and 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 and, learn, and and you know determining. I think up to this point, we've had local our local partners and communities look at this in a very local uh, a local way. So they're essentially I think there's sort of a, you know, different mecha different mechanisms they're using. And in those cases where we have community groups that have relationships with property owners or tenants, they tend to have. Uh, you know, a sense of what is actually happening um, on the ground, and therefore we've used a mechanism to help them deploy a localized solution to address that issue. I think on a citywide basis, I don't think we have at this point figured out a mechanism by which to assess that or measure it. Okay, well that's important. I think it's, a, it's very important for us to be able, if crafting solutions, to be able to measure the problem in the first instance. And uh, you know, it sounds like the city's leaning heavily on local partners to help uh, deliver this information, but having our own ability to measure that, I think, is also, uh, it's very important. Um, let's talk about the timing of what has happened, um, because it sounds like the, at least there's a, agreement in principle here that we are in the middle of something that is unique and different and problematic for New York City, not just a cyclical uh, trend. Um, so help us identify when this problem really started picking up in earnest, if you can. As 
as uh, the deputy commissioner was just saying, I don't think that at this time we have a perfect way across the city to measure the baseline of vacancy rates across the city. So I don't know that we have an exact time that we could pinpoint as a start. Well, what tools does the city have to measure? And this probably is a question for the Department of Finance. Uh, if the city were looking to identify uh, a moment in time or a period in time in which um, small businesses were starting either to go out of business or where um, there was something changing that was um, putting small businesses out of business, let's say lack of sales, for example. Um, are, are there ways that the Department of, of Finance measures these types of things that could give us more of a clue as to when the problem really became acute? Um, I think I would have to go back to our tax policy division and talk to them a little bit more about business tax filings and see when we saw a dip in revenues from the small business uh, filings. Um, but in addition, I think, when, uh, to echo my colleagues here, I think part of the issue is still defining a criteria uh, for establishing what is truly vacant that would also interplay with how we would inform this. Okay. There's no question that we, we, we have to, in, in, the, in the department of being absolutely precise about this, have to define exactly what a vacancy is. But I think that we at least have to acknowledge the fact that there are a lot of vacancies out there, and they're vacant for a very, very long time, uh, not because somebody's about to come in, just because they're sitting there. So let's talk about the core reason for that. And I think you cited a few potential examples in your testimony, whether it's landlord speculation or businesses not keeping up with changing clientele, neighborhood divestment. Let's, let's talk about those in greater depth, because I think those are really the core questions that we want to answer at today's hearing. Um, If you look out and you see a 20% vacancy rate in a, in a particular corridor, um, I mean, we could you know, give one of the ones on 14th Street or Bleecker Street or uh, take Upper West Side. You could take you know, uh, other, other spots. Um, to what, on a neighborhood basis, uh, can you attribute those sorts of continued, ongoing, unrelenting vacancies? Thank you for the question. Um, as you mentioned in your remarks and, and I in my testimony, there are a whole slew of reasons that any one corridor or even property could be experiencing commercial vacancy. It could be that the rise in online commerce has impacted the business, um, rent increases as a result of a strong real estate market, it could be that landlords are holding out and speculating, um, keeping a space empty for a better credit-worthy tenant, whether that's true or perceived. Um, in other places across the city, it could be divestment in neighborhoods. So there's a, there's a whole range of reasons, and it could vary even within one corridor. Right, but I guess what I, I would look to the Department of Small Business Services to answer that question. And to say, well, what, which of those, which of those reasons is the prevailing reason? It, well, let's just take um, take Bleecker Street as an mm -hmm. example. Um, is that an example of neighborhood divestment, or, or is that an example of something else? I think that you know, as I stated in the testimony and in our conversation here, that we don't have a perfect way, except in areas where we have local partners to do some of this work to understand the underlying causes at a corridor or specific property level, and it's something that we're committed to finding the tools to do well and across the city. Okay, let's talk about the different categories then for a second. Um, what can you tell us about landlord speculation? Um, describe what that looks like, what you've seen to the extent that you've measured it at all, or to the extent that you've used local partners to uh, define what that looks like. Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of landlord speculation? Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. I mean, again, I would say in terms of what we are seeing, I think we have similar um, sort of anecdotal information and, and sort of studies that we've seen that, that attest to this issue. I think what I could say, what SVS has been able to 
um, poll is, is typically so it's in districts like you referred to, like 14th Street or others in your district, um, would be our business improvement district partners. And I think in that case, we have relied on them to, to gather that information where they can. Um, the capacity to do so varies dramatically, of course, in these organizations. But where they can, I think, um, I think we, you know, we've heard this issue that that speculation is is a factor, uh, just based on you know the the perception of neighborhood change or things to come, or you know literally what they are hearing their colleague or their next door neighbor got in rent and they want to get that same amount of rent. So I think there was there's a lot of conversations happening on, on a local level that cause additional speculation, where our partners have attempted to address that issue is literally door to door conversations with property owners to temper their expectations um, to you know provide some uh, data where they have it where they can actually perhaps um, provide a reality check where, where, where merited that uh, you know that they should be willing to accept you know the opportunity cost of leaving their space vacant is, is problematic problematic not only for their property but for the neighborhood as a whole and the commercial district as a whole so we're, we're seeing that and, and we're seeing bids attempt to tackle this issue um, but I think um, again, it varies so dramatically on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis that I don't think we're able to draw uh, a conclusion citywide. Is there a particular neighborhood where you believe landlord speculation is most significant or rampant? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I can't say that I've looked at the data enough or, or have enough data, I guess I should say, is more accurate um, to make that conclusion. But I, I think walking the city, I, I think I, you know, I see what you see, and I see that there are cl clearly neighborhoods where it has ramped up in recent years, where in the past we saw vacancies in neighborhoods, perhaps not in the sort of central business district or in Manhattan as much. We saw it in neighborhoods that had suffered disinvestment, and that's where over the course of the last five to ten years, the city and SBS developed tools to address that type of vacancy, and that's where we've really been able to invest a considerable amount of resources in community partners to address that type you know, that vacancy that, uh, that uh, I think came about for other reasons. And I think now we're all, I think, uh, need to work with the council to develop those kind of tools to address what we're seeing happening right now. And I would just add, you know, we are taking a proactive approach to helping combat this as well. In the case of something like a landlord beginning to speculate or neighborhood change, we believe one of the best ways to combat that is through helping business owners have good leases on the books. So we're not waiting to see large swaths of vacant spaces before we're going out to business owners and talking to them about what they should be looking for in leases, negotiating leases, et cetera. Okay, I'd like to note we've been joined by Council Members Barron, Cornegie, and Richards. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to go to, uh, to Council Member uh, Kozlowitz for, for questions. Um, I, I did want to ask you um, about the other two categories, or really neighborhood divestment, I think we can put in its own, in its own category, but the, the issue of businesses not keeping up with changing clientele. Does that also include, uh, on, I mean, online shopping, right? You, you don't have any more people to sell to because the people you used to sell to are now buying things online. Is that, include, yeah. is that included? Absolutely. Uh, what, what else would that include from your perspective? So, as you know, the work of the Department of Small Business Services includes supporting businesses when they start and grow and helping them to adapt all across the city. So this is something we're constantly looking at. Um, changing neighborhoods could include changing demographics, seasonality, it could include rise of e-commerce, and we work actively to ensure that all of our programming helps businesses adjust to these changes. Right now, we have already started to include um, education around e-commerce, getting businesses to put their businesses online, sell their products online, um, and, and we've also done that in a more intensive way through programs like Love Your Local, where business advisors will look at everything like table turns and the amount you're spending on your products in order to help businesses adjust and adapt to neighborhood trends that are changing. Uh, the way you described the Love Your Local program mm -hmm. was um, helping businesses that are no longer viable in their existing space. Um, why, why is the city spending uh, time and resources on businesses that we have concluded 
based on I guess the data that is actually available to us that they're no longer that they're no longer viable. Great question. Um, Love your local is really about helping long-standing businesses that may or may not be viable with their current business practices stay in their neighborhoods. You know, you brought up at the beginning your favorite restaurant, your favorite local retailer. We want to make sure that those businesses are able to compete even as e-commerce you know, rises and impacts retailers internationally, even as a neighborhood changes. So we're using Love Your Local to really delve into the books of those businesses, understand how they can make changes that would allow them to stay in their space and their neighborhood. And from that work, we hope to identify scalable and implementable solutions that we can work on to help businesses all across the city stay in their neighborhoods. Is there an example of a business that has been the beneficiary of a Love Your Local grant uh, that was otherwise on the cusp as a result of e-commerce that now we can say conclusively that it was our tax dollars which helped to protect and preserve it? We're still accepting applications for the program, so it's very new. Yes, but we would you know, love anyone's help in getting the word out about it and um, be happy to follow up as we get results. Okay. I, I, I'm going to actually – I noted it with the commissioner at one of our last hearings. I, I actually am not certain that it passes the New York State constitutional gift ban prohib, uh, prohibition, but that's a, that's, a, that's a subject for a different hearing for a different day. Uh, but uh, I want to go to Chair Carnegie for a quick statement as the chair of the Small Business Committee, and then we're going to go off uh, to Council Member Koswitz. Mr. Chairman, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Gorodnik. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the chair not only for his leadership on economic development issues as a chair of this committee for the past four years, but most importantly for his 12 years of outstanding service to the city of New York and to the constituents of the 4th Fourth Count Fourth Matic District. It's been an honor to serve with and learn from you over the course of the past four years. So again, thank you. As chair of the city, the city Council's Committee on Small Business, I've spent the last four years grappling with the important issues facing our city's mom and pop shops. I believe we as a council have made important progress in creating a friendlier environment for our city small businesses during the past season. We've managed to reduce fines for small business owners. We have created, funded, and expanded mobile business services through Chamber on the Go, passed legislation creating a right of action for commercial tenants facing harassment and neglect from their landlords, and most recently, thanks to the leadership of Chair Garodnik, we reformed the commercial rent tax to help small businesses struggling afford their rents in Manhattan. While we've made great strides forward as a city, the crisis of retail affordability obviously persists. In order to address the crisis, the Council must prioritize policies that ease burdens on our small businesses and find new ways to carve out commercial space that is affordable to local business owners in neighborhoods throughout New York City. Today, the Council released um, a report I was fortunate enough to help put together with Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, Land Use Chair David Greenfield, and Chair of Subcommittee of Zoning Donovan Richards that lays out a blueprint for how the Council can address storefront vacancy and commercial affordability <laughs> moving forward. I'd like to take a moment to highlight a few key proposals from that report that I believe are crucial for the City to advance. One, collect and analyze storefront retail data in each community district as a part of a citywide commercial district needs assessment. Two, require storefront vacancy reporting. Three, create a zoning bonus for affordable retail space. Four, prioritize affordable local retail space in certain city-sponsored developments. And five, strengthen Chamber on the Go. The Chamber on the Go initiative, which began with a partnership between myself and the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, should continue to be strengthened and expanded in order to increase capacity to provide on-the-ground canvassing of neighborhood small businesses and offer direct assistance to businesses instead of relying primarily on requests for consultations. I urge my colleagues to read the report and look forward to working with all of them moving forward to implement many of the policies that it proposes. Thank you, Chair Garodnik, again. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Chair Carnegie, and the feeling is certainly mutual. It's been an honor to work with you. Um, before I go to uh, Councilmember Kozlowitz, and thank you for your patience, I just, I, I just want to pose a, th a theory, and I want you to tell me whether you think you agree with it or disagree with it. My theory, having prepared for the hearing and watch this issue develop is that somewhere in the time period of 2013 to 2015 there was a significant drop off of uh, retail as a result of uh, you know the prevalence of online shopping 
contemporaneously, landlords were getting increasingly opportunistic about their rents and hopeful that they would be able to do better and better and better over time, uh, forcing some businesses out and uh, discontinuing other leases. Uh, the result was vacancies that had rents that were being sought, which were way too high for the existing market situation, uh, and based on uh, the, the demands of lenders for particular uh, building owners, uh, they did not want to necessarily jump in and take lower rent leases, lest it subject them to difficult conversations with the people who lent the money to buy the building in the first place. Uh, and at the same time, some of these businesses may not be coming back. And there has not yet been a uh, commensurate reckoning with the fact that we may have a changing local commercial situation. Uh, and that confluence of factors has left a lot of these um, storefronts vacant. That's the thesis. Challenge it, test it, tell me it's right, wrong, anywhere in between. But that's what I think is going on. Tell me what you think. I mean, I'm happy to have my colleagues add to this, but I think it's certainly plausible. And I think that, like we've been saying, um, we look forward to working with council to really dig into this issue and understand what the underlying causes are. I think it's a plausible set of theories. All right. Well, um, is it too much for us to ask um, SBS to come back to us with your best estimate of at least the prevalent cause or whether you agree, disagree, or um, – anywhere in between on the thesis that I just uh, posited sometime, say, before the end of the year? I think we could follow up offline on the timetable. Okay. Well, I've only got a couple weeks left, so, uh, you know, my timetable is pretty strict. Um, but, yes, we can follow up on the timetable, but, uh, you know, it's a pretty urgent matter for me. Okay. Council Member Kozlowitz. Thank you. Um, one of the things I could tell you is that to find out data, you can speak to elected officials because I could tell you exactly what's going on in my area, which is Forest Hills, Rego Park, it's the Continental Avenue and the 63rd Drive and Queens Boulevard of stores. In 2009, I wanted to rent a store for my campaign. And we offered the owner $3,900. The store was empty. Well, eight years later, the store was just rented this past September. So for eight years, the store went vacant. On 63rd and Queens Boulevard, we had a topless bar called Wiggles. And that has been vacant for years. And I'm living in my neighborhood 55 years. And I have seen a change in my neighborhood. There was a frozen yogurt place on Continental Avenue. We called and asked what the rent was going to be because the place was going out of business. $25,000 for a, not a big store, maybe as big as this room or smaller, you have to sell a lot of custard mm -hmm. to pay $25,000. And it went out of business. And this has been going on. We know what's going on in our neighborhood, so you can get data from us. I speak to the landlords in my community all the time. I have a doctor who's calling my office. His landlord wants to throw him out, and he wants to collect taxes from years ago. He wants to go all the way back and collect taxes that he did not pay and was never asked to pay, and all of a sudden now he wants to pay taxes, and he did it to the bakery also there. So 
something is out of hand. Something is out of hand how people can get away and harass these people who are trying to make a living. We used to have beautiful boutiques on Continental Avenue and Austin Street. People used to come from all over. It's changed drastically, and I'm not just the only one telling. All my constituents call all the time and say it's changed. So something has to be looked into to see why this change is happening and not just continue to allow it to happen. It's happening in my area, I'm sure in a lot of my other colleagues' areas, in every borough. In every borough, this is happening. So I really have to ask you, where are you looking at data that you do collect? Are you looking in other boroughs? Thank you, Council Member, for the question. And uh, thank you for your offer to work with us to, you know, leverage Not just council me, members. I'm sure oh, all my colleagues. Absolutely. I mean, as we have stated, the administration and SBS is extremely committed to getting to the bottom of what is causing storefront vacancies. We know that it's a local issue. Um, and I would love to speak with you to figure out ways to leverage council member and resident intel across the city so that we can really understand what's happening all over at a local level. I think we have to sit down with the landlords and ask them why they are doing this. Why, why are, what, what benefit are they getting to having a store empty for eight years? Eight years. Mm -hmm. That's a very long time. And what makes them not try and rent the store? I mean, all of a sudden, in September, the, the one that was vacant for eight years, all of a sudden he rented to uh, a hearing aid place. So I'm curious to know what took eight years to do. We agree. Also curious and would be happy to work with you to speak with landlords okay. and identify different issues. And I have to just say that the commissioner has been wonderful from SBS. He has been out to my community and you know, we have worked with, we were trying to do a bid on Continental Avenue and Austin Street. So he has been very cooperative. But after that, we just have to find out what is happening, what's going on with all these landlords that just, you know, they don't care about the neighborhood. They don't live in the neighborhood. Thank you, and we, we look forward to working with you on that. And I just want to say before I leave, I have to I have another hearing downstairs. Dan, it's been a pleasure, a pleasure working with you. I know you're not going away, and I know I'll be seeing you, but thank you for everything you've done. Thank you very much, Karen. I appreciate that. Um, on to Council Member Richards. Thank you, Chair, and I just want to echo that. It's been an honor. Uh, to work with you. I, going back, knowing Dan now, I feel like five years intimately uh, when he was actually out helping me in other ways uh, in frigid weather to actually achieve the goal of being a council member. Uh, I really appreciate your leadership in the council and all the work you've done on a vast uh, amount of subjects uh, in the council that will affect New Yorkers uh, for lifespans, and they won't understand why things have happened, uh, but we'll be able to point to a lot of these things that have happened due to Dan Garotnik's leadership, and I'm thankful uh, for you for that. All righty, enough schmoozing. Now on to the next subject. Um, hi, SBS. Hello. Pleasure to see you again. Uh, and I also want to echo uh, that uh, your commissioner has been phenomenal. We have a lot of work to do, uh, and I'm proud that uh, the commissioner has seen just about every inch of my district and, and we're doing some good work out there. Um, so one of the issues we face in Southeast Queens uh, in particular is the issue around absentee landlords. And what happens a lot is we have landlords who are uh, living in Florida and, and all over the country and, and perhaps in other countries uh, to some degree and what we found is that many of these landlords are just, they're, they're not interested uh, in the quality of life of our communities. They're not necessarily interested uh, in moving forward. One, pri forward. one prime example of that is a land uh, absentee landlord who passed away, unfortunately, uh, Rita Stark, who held on to property, a vacant mall, 
uh, for 50 years in my district while unemployed people walk past it, past it uh, while the need for more commerce and commercial development was needed, and it, it really was shameful. I'm glad that we now, the city has unlocked the tool of urban renewal, which I think is moving uh, us into a different uh, direction now. So I, I want to go into some quick questions, and you have seen the council's plan today. I'm happy to be a part of uh, retail diversity plan. Have you read through this document yet? Come on, what's going on? <laughs> you don't have anything better to do at 5 a.m. in the morning? Read through these we things? We saw that it came out, but we have not had a chance to review all righty, the recommendations. All righty. It's a good answer. Um, so one of the things uh, we I've spoken about, and this is not necessarily in this report, is a vacancy tax. Has there been any conversation around entertaining a vacancy tax on particular establishments that are vacant and where absentee landlords have no interest in, in really ensuring that uh, storefronts are improved or in that businesses are coming in? Thank you for the question. What is the administration's stance? Are they open to a vacancy tax on some of these properties? Because quite frankly, for people like Rita Stark or the Stark Properties, God rest her soul, um, you know, the only way to ensure, I, I feel like they uh, will move forward, is to ensure that there is some punitive measure perhaps attached to it. So have we thought about a vacancy tax? Hi, uh, Sheila Fonder. And that's tax base we're also losing in the city that I'm certain we could use. So has there been any thought around that? You know, the city's, uh, the city's looking at a number of possible solutions. I think that's on the table for consideration. Um, I, we are aware that other municipalities have started to think that way as well. We haven't made a decision yet, though. When will you? We're still reviewing it. Um, okay. you know, we'll be in touch. Uh, in the report, we also spoke of uh, a, a, a road or a vision where we thought SBS, a scenario where we thought SBS could actually file uh, land use applications uh, in related to, to retail. Uh, have you thought about that? Uh, I think it's an interesting proposal. I think it's something we'd, we'd love to hear more about. But I, I mean, I could say already, obviously, we rely on our partners and colleagues at the Department of City Planning to do so, and we already we do work with them quite closely on neighborhoods in which we're working, um, both you know whether it's related to the Housing New York plan as well as even within some business improvement districts and others that are looking at sort of uh, you know commercial or retail land use changes. So I think um, you know, we're, we're happy to hear more about the proposal. Okay, and then the fresh initiative. Let's go through that uh, quickly. Where are we at? I know we've been talking about this for over a year now. Uh, has there been any progress on the expansion of FRESH? I know that we're going back and forth with the council, um, interested in knowing when will we put this to bed. Thank you for the question. I mean, we are, um, you know, as we've said, interested in all different types of solutions that make sense on a neighborhood by neighborhood level, um, and happy to follow up with EDC about any updates on FRESH. Okay, that'll give me all the political answers today. Um, let's see. Um, uh, NYCHA as well, so another strategy in, within the, the council's plan has been a conversation around ensuring uh, perhaps NYCHA, and without displacing residents, we have no interest in, in doing that, but have you given any thought to uh, commercial overlays in public housing? Opportunities, a lot of opportunity in public housing that we have not thought about, and it could be controversial, I'm not saying yay or nay right now, but has there been a, a thought process uh, in place to maximize more opportunities uh, to create job opportunities and uh, food access opportunities in NYCHA? I, I could say, I mean, I think it's, a, again, an interesting idea. I know certainly some NYCHA developments already do have um, retail overlays when they do front a commercial district, and they certainly have been really helpful. Uh, opportunities both for you know local small businesses and job creation. So I, I think it's an interesting proposal, and we'd certainly love to hear more about it and speak tonight about it. Another political answer. All righty. Um, bids. So historically, bids, and I'm happy we now have the JFK Springfield Industrial bid. 
but what I find is in a lot of, uh, and I know that it's a tricky situation because local businesses would have to pay in, but one of the things that att would attract people to business districts is making sure that the business district is attractive. And um, I'm interested in knowing where we at in the process of the kickoff for the Far Rockaway study for a bid. Um, downtown Far Rockaway bid, and, and what is your world view? Are you looking at communities like South Jamaica that uh, my colleague Adrian Adams represents now, uh, communities that have historically not uh, been on the radar of the city the way that uh, we would like it to be? Has there been any thought process in expanding more bid opportunities uh, in communities that historically the city has not reached? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. I, I think, you know, as, as you and I have spoken numerous times, I mean, the, the SBS sees, sees the bid process and the bid formation process as, as very much a locally driven effort. So we are always open to speaking to any, any of our, you know, our council members or community groups that are interested in forming a bid in their commercial district. Uh, we, you know, we do, we we do often rely though on the on sort of the, our council member colleagues as well as a community group, uh, be it a local one or a borough wide entity, that is interested in taking the lead in the effort. It does require uh, considerable, as you know, bandwidth to do to do this kind of work. Uh, ground around ground to ground, uh, you know, door to door organizing in a commercial district it can take uh, well over two years. So it's not uh, so as uh, so in regards to downtown Far Rockaway, as you know, we are. Um, we are working to get um, sort of the resources to do a commercial district needs assessment there as and then work to do sort of the a feasibility study for a bid given that we would like to uh, ensure that there is a, the commercial and retail density to, to support a business improvement district and as you know we we work with RDRC um, and are having ongoing conversations with them about how we might take on that work next year um, I think as far as I can't speak to um, um, the other part of the Southeast Queens that you've spoken about, but I think, again, if there were a, a, a borough-wide entity or a local group that is interested in taking on that effort, it's really, certainly something we'd, we'd love to speak to them about. Merrick Boulevard as well. And I'm just going to read some astounding facts because uh, so we released this plan today, and it speaks of zip codes with the lowest access to retail. And there has not really been, in my purview, a strategy uh, that has really put in, been put in place to really address uh, this issue. So I'm hoping SBS is really going to look at the council's plan and look at it seriously and figure out ways uh, to creatively or innovatively look at solutions to addressing this. So for instance, zip codes with the lowest access to retail, uh, Auburn, 11692, for 15, for 15 establishments with a population of 1,236 individuals. Um, East Elmhurst, 45 around establishments, population per, population per retail and, and restaurant establishment, uh, 858. Um, and the list just goes on. I mean, Laurelton, uh, retail and restaurant establishments, uh, 64. Population per retail and restaurant establishment, 608. So the things we've laid out here really are, I feel, blueprints, a, a, a good blueprint uh, to really getting us to a place. I know Manhattan is very unique. It's a un more unique in a way than Southeast Queens is. The city's a very big place, so one uh, shoe does not fit all, you know, fit all sizes here. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we're going to have to look at these strategies that I think could uh, certainly serve all five boroughs well. So I want to thank the chairman that have taken up enough time. Um, so I'm hoping to hear back from SBS on the questions and, and, and certainly the, the pathway and blueprint the council has provided that we believe can create affordable uh, small business opportunities and ensure we're boosting uh, local retail opportunities. Thank you, council member. We're very excited to read it. I know a lot of work and thinking went into the report. And as you know, SBS is committed to helping businesses start and grow in New York City and having thriving neighborhoods in all five boroughs. So we look forward to working with you on both ideas in that report and others that we come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. Councilmember Adams. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Grodnick. Uh, first of all, I'd also like to say thank you so much for welcoming me so warmly uh, to this wonderful council and to my colleagues as well. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, 
I'm just going to um, ask because I, I just need to know. I didn't hear anywhere in you. And thank you for your testimony today, by the way. Um, this is such a long-standing issue for a lot of us, and we know that a lot of attention is paid to Manhattan, um, understandably so. But as uh, my colleagues from Queens have mentioned, we have experienced this blight for a long, long time. So I guess I'm just interested to know, because this is such a long-standing issue, how long have you been um, engaged in this study? Has it just been during this past fiscal year? Is this a brand new uh, situation for SBS to embrace this particular study. Thank you, Council Member. Wants a question? Uh, I want to make sure I understand when you say this study, you're referring to the Council study. I, I'm talking about um, I'm talking about broadly, broadly the vacancy issue. issue broadly. Sure. Sorry. Yes. Um, so, no, so no, it's definitely not a brand new issue for us, and I think actually the the issues that comes that um, Councilmember Richards were speaking to is actually where we have been investing for quite some time. Um, the, the Avenue NYC grant program, for example, that uh, my colleague spoke about is a federally funded program using CDBG dollars um, uh, that we grant out to community-based organizations in low to moderate income communities. Um, and one of, you know, there's a multiple sort of um, strategies these groups undertake, but a lot of the work tends to be around business attraction and retention. Uh, so we work with those groups um, uh, essentially every year. So we've been doing it, you know, well over ten years. But we we grant out about one to one point two million dollars a year uh, to these uh, uh, nonprofit organizations to take on uh, business attraction and retention activities, and that can involve everything from, you know, actual sort of, um, you know. Uh, collateral, say, to attract um, retail tenants to an area, to work uh, with retail brokers to help track to the type of tenants, um, actually doing some of the data gathering that is necessary to assess where vacancies are, who those property owners are, and helping to make those connections to possible tenants. Um, a lot of work um, can be done around actually boosting the foot traffic and through, through events and promotions, that type of thing. So there is a, a range of activities, and, and a lot, I should say, certainly on the retention side is really about connecting those neighborhoods and those uh, businesses to SBS's existing suite of services like commercial lease negotiation and, uh, and other things like that. Uh, thank you. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Councilmember Koslowitz did speak about uh, properties in her district that were vacant for a very long time. I, too, experienced the same thing coming off of uh, two campaigns uh, and looking for office space. The issue um, that some of us find is the issue of rent and high rent. Um, what was your outreach to, to the landlords, particularly in the instance that we have in Southeast Queens with a lot of absentee landlords? What specifically was your outreach to these landlords to find out where they were and why they continue to do and have these practices? So again, just, just to make sure I'm clear, you know, it's not SBS staff doing this type of work in these neighborhoods. Uh, our small team, essentially, we're granting money out to the local community-based organization. Uh, to take on the type of work. So just just to quickly say how it would tip, would work is a you know a community based organization will you know apply to a grant opportunity. They will essentially um, you know provide their local knowledge of what's going on in the neighborhood based on the information they have and their understanding of the local um, conditions on the ground. And they will apply to us for, uh, to carry out certain activities uh, that they believe will will help to address the issue. And and we certainly try to. Uh, provide best practices and technical assistance so those organizations, you know, are not starting from scratch but are actually learning from what other groups have done in, in the city. Uh, so in a case like that, I mean, I, I guess I, I can't speak to the, the specifics of, uh, of, again, because each situation is unique, but certainly an organization that has a local ties and local familiarity with their community, typically what a group would do is, you know, is literally build up their local database of, of local of landlords, tenants, who has leases in place and begin doing door-to-door -door outreach, and, and when they are there is a long-standing vacancy like the ones you're referring to, you know, try to track down that local that landlord, whether that person is local or not local, uh, and, tr and really try to make a case uh, to you know if, you know to learn why they're holding it vacant, and in and in the case where that you know that is a reason, I guess where you can where they can make a case that. Uh, you know, kind of the community pride case or, or saying that, hey, if this community actually does have disposable income or there is this need based on our leakage study of why this type of business is needed in this community. So it really, the way we've seen community groups do it is, is truly a highly localized, personalized approach 
Um, not always effective, but we have seen it work. And I would just add that I'd like to extend the invitation. Um, we'd love to work with you and leverage council members all over the city to reach out to landlords and really get at what are the underlying causes of vacancy in your district. Okay, great. That actually um, pulls on to the next kind of part B uh, to, to, to that question. Are you satisfied with those results of your outreach? So again, um, I would say the groups that, so just to give you, I do have some numbers just to give you a sense. So we funded um, essentially, actually I'm looking at the wrong data, but you know, we'll typically give out about 49, um, 40 to 45 grants a year to organizations. It's not a huge amount of money. It's about $30,000 typically per grant to these organizations. Um, we have seen for those groups that we fund business attraction and retention work um, that they report back to us on average that they're you know between six and eight businesses a year that they are able to either attract or retain in that district. So, I think we are satisfied with the with the results based on the investment we've what we've made and the investment we have from these federal dollars. But um, I think it's it's a you know a program that certainly should we could we get more federal money for this purpose? I think it would be would be valuable. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, did you say? I was just going to add that I think, as we've mentioned, um, we're looking for scalable ways to, across the city, regardless of community groups, get access to this information. So I think my colleague would agree that we could always do more to get better data, and we look forward to working with you on brainstorming ideas to make that happen. Thank you. Um, I will also echo um, the remarks of my colleague, uh, Councilmember Richards, I think that you really, really need to take this um, to heart. Um, it's going to be a fantastic resource for you, and I encourage you to really, really use this as your blueprint. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Richards had one one point to add. And I just wanted to add, I you know, we keep hearing we should do all the, the, this great work, and with limited staff, and we got a lot of work to do, SBS also has a, more of an obligation. I understand the limitations on staffing. Um, but perhaps that's a budget conversation we need to have, um, you know, on how does SBS get out there and do this sort of outreach and, and, and look strategically in areas like Merrick Boulevard and areas like South Jamaica. Um, and I don't want to say, say do your job, but figure ways to be creative because for us to chase down absentee landlords, we don't have that those sort of resources, but it's something your agency is certainly tasked with. Not saying you're not doing it, we pre appreciate uh, the mobile unit. It's been great. You were in Far Rockaway, I think, just a day ago, um, but really doing a little bit more, uh, a, 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 a deeper dive into uh, why these particular retail destinations as they should be are, are, are suffering from absentee landlords. Thank you, and you know, thank you to Council also for giving us additional resources to do programs like Chamber on the Go, which has enabled us to get out to corridors all over the city. So appreciate that and all of our partnership to date. That's great, but let's get to the landlords. Sounds good. Let's figure that out. Thank you, Councilmember Richards, Councilmember Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. Now. Uh, We've heard discussion about some of the reasons that these storefronts are vacant. Uh, high rent, you know, the commercial rent tax, and people not being able to, the tenants not being able to pay the rent. And we've heard about the e-commerce. Uh, I want to ask a question. Has your agency been able to have any kind of metrics or have any data that draws parallels between those storefronts that are being warehoused, deliberately kept vacant by the owners who perhaps have some speculative view towards the increased rents which they will get as areas become gentrified. Just so I understand the question, it's really around what are the nuances about right. why the why, why we have which is you know we're talking about these storefront vacancies so what kind of data have we drawn any parallels 
between those that are deliberately vacant, and uh, my colleague referred to one that had been vacant for 15, 20, whatever years. Mm -hmm. So do we have any data that indicates owners who are keeping it vacant because they're speculating that as this move towards rezoning comes and as areas become gentrified, that they will then have better returns and increased revenues? I think it's a, a great question. I mean, I think at best we have some anecdotal information from the work that community groups have done on the ground, but truly we believe it is essential for any sort of policy solution and tools for us to have better data on the underlying nuanced causes of vacancy. So we are actively thinking about and would appreciate council's ideas and thoughts on how we would best get that and are looking forward to working with you on the topic. And, and as you do that uh, exploration, uh, I just received this document, but in glancing through it, I see where it says the top 10 small retail or restaurant gains and zip codes in neighborhoods that have an increase. And at the bottom of the list is 11208 mm -hmm. Cypress Hills, East New York. And as you may know, that was a targeted area. It's been targeted for about the last eight years at least for rezoning. And that's included in the increase here. And it says 209 small retailers and restaurants in 2012, a change of plus 96, which represents 85%. So I think that gets to the point that I'm trying to raise, that there are people who are definitely owners who are definitely speculating and willing to have this vacant space so that when um, this rezoning comes in and when these opportunities come in to increase their revenues, then they're willing to offer this space up. So that's something that I think we should look at as well. Thank you, and I do have another hearing, Thank so you. I have to leave. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Uh, and I'm going to uh, um, finish up with just a few last uh, questions. Um, from my understanding from our uh, colloquy before is that perhaps SBS does not have the data necessary to say which boroughs have been most impacted by vacant storefronts. Is that accurate? Yes, I think that's accurate. Uh, and uh, you, you also had said before that the city does not itself track vacant storefronts. Is that correct? That is correct as far as I know. Uh, would there be a benefit um, to the city to actually having that information? Uh, and just, again, I think it's important to have the, the number. Subject, sub, uh, yeah, subject, subject to, to your, yeah. your uh, the asterisk that you got to define it properly. If you do have like, to define uh, it properly, but also I was going to say the having the number might get you some things, but having the reason why um, properties or retail storefronts might be vacant I think will be critical to any sort of decision-making or policy-making process. Okay, and, and, and to that point, what does SBS need to be able to come to an a, a concrete assessment of the answer to that question. The, sorry, can you ask the, the question of <laughs> why? The why? Okay. Is it what happening? do we need? Yeah. What do you, what What do you lack? If vacancies alone won't tell you, which I agree with, uh, what What more do you need? I mean, I think. You, you probably heard us say it over and over again, you know, that we're very committed to trying to figure out truly the best way to collect this data. Um, and depending on sort of the results of our conversations and hopefully further conversations with you and reading the report, I think we would have a much better answer on whether we need more resources, we need a different system in place to collect information, we need to support community groups. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different policies or initiatives you might do to collect the information. So I just don't think we have a, an answer at this time about what we would need. Okay. Well, I mean, I would note, and I'll direct you um, just by way of example to mm -hmm. page 22 of the council's report, and I know it came to you early this morning. wouldn't expect you to have you know, seen it yet. But, but the council's report has access to some of the information, which mm -hmm. it seems like uh, SBS is struggling to obtain. Um, for example, the change in retailers and restaurants with revenues less than a million dollars by zip code, in which this, this red area here, of course, 
and over here is loss of 40, uh, 40 or more. The green areas have seen gains. Um, so uh, have a look at it. We should discuss this further, uh, but um, I, I don't think that we're going to come out of this hearing with an understanding from SBS as to, one, um, whether vacancy uh, stats are going to help you answer that question, and two, what exactly it is that you need to be able to answer that question. So that's a, li that's a, a little disappointing because I, you know, I have a theory, but it doesn't sound like you're even ready to critique my theory, um, but I would like you to. Um, so I, I, think it, I, you know, I think we do need to get to the, to the core question of what's happening before we prescribe any policy solutions, and we're not yet, we're not yet there. Um, do you have any uh, figures about um, revenues that are generated by small businesses, uh, money that's being put back into communities by small businesses as opposed to chain stores? Is there, is there any uh, measurement of small businesses versus chain stores as to, uh, you know, whether they're serving as multipliers in local communities. Is there any way that SBS measures that? So um, from the SBS standpoint, I could give you my thoughts, and I don't know, Department of Finance, if you have any modeling on that. I would say that we haven't done that kind of modeling yet, but that's something that I could bring back to the to our team and see what we can find out. And we have, we have done some thinking on that. I don't have the numbers with me right now, but I'm happy to follow up on it. Okay, as part of our end of year uh, follow up, I think that would be great. Um, okay, um, and lastly, uh, do, you, do you think that um, SBS is doing enough uh, to be able to get to the bottom of this question? I mean, you cited a number of initiatives there. Um, you know, can you be, uh, in any way self-critical or, or, or not uh, about whether you believe SBS is doing enough to try to get to the core questions about what exactly is happening out there? I mean, in my testimony and, you know, all today, I think we've done a lot to try to both understand and address the issue. It's a very complex issue, and it's one you need to understand at a hyper-local level, so understanding it in a city with 200,000 plus small businesses is no small feat. Um, we have worked with local community groups. We have thought about really intensive ways to help businesses adapt. We've been thinking about how you protect small businesses um, in their lease arrangement with landlords. But there's always more that we could be doing. And I think that we strongly believe that in order to have effective policy solutions, you need to understand the underlying cause of the issue. And there are many of them. I think we would both agree there's many different causes um, to storefront vacancy. So, you know, we're committed to finding a scalable way to understand root causes and creating effective policy solutions around that. Well, and we look well, forward I, to working with council. I on thank it. you. Yeah, I thank you for that. I mean, the only observation I would make um, is that there's there's hyper local then there's local and you know i mean if you look at let's say both sides of central park in manhattan uh the whatever it is is probably the same thing uh and you know in those in those areas where you might be able to find commonality uh i, I you know i think you could probably take some of the the reasons off the table and then focus on what really is going on and then measure it from there. So I just would make that observation. Completely agree. I think there are certainly going to be patterns across the city, but that we'll have to think about each neighborhood and assess it on its own. Okay. Uh, with that, um, I thank you for your testimony today. Uh, we appreciate it very thank much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now I uh, have the great privilege of inviting uh, up to the witness stand the president of the borough of Manhattan, Gail Brewer. Welcome, welcome back, Madam President. And thank you for your advocacy on this issue. And whenever you're comfortable and settled, we're ready for you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I had to borrow somebody's glasses at the city council because I lost mine on the way over here. <laughs> So I am honored to be here. I am Gail Brewer, and I am the Manhattan Borough President. 
And just like everyone else, there are no words with which to thank Chairman Gorodnik uh, for his leadership. And I want to thank all the members of the Committee on Economic Development. This is a very important hearing, and I think you might know that I have spent a lot of my career fighting to protect storefronters or mom and pops or owner operators through advocacy legislation and zoning actually since 1985. That's a long time. Um, I just, before I go into some points, I want to just a couple of comments about what I heard because it is interesting. I do want to say uh, to you, Chairman, absolutely the issues that you listed are part of why there are vacancies. There's a couple more as to numbers, um, vacancy being part of it, online being part of it, and rent being the number one. But also, some years ago, federal tax law changed so that co-ops, condos, co-ops in particular, can get all of their revenue from non-shareholders. So in other words, it used to be that 80% of your revenue had to come from the shareholders. Um, now, it can come from outside. So a commercial is a good way so then your share, your maintenance doesn't go up. Now that's a good thing for the shareholders, for the co-ops that are on avenues where they have uh, commercial tenants, but it's another piece of the puzzle. And, and um, the other one is new buildings. There are a couple ways of handling them. Obviously where we have a rezoning, in my case uh, on the Upper West Side, we mandated that the stores be a certain size in the rezoning. Um, it did not happen in East Harlem because there were other mitigating factors, but you can limit. And in Jerome Avenue, there has been limitation, particularly in support of those that are uh, auto shops and kinds of uses that are needed for the kinds of jobs that they produce. So zoning, I think, can be a tool as opposed to not helpful. I just want to throw that out. But we don't have all the answers with um, any of these suggestions. And the final one is when you have a new building, the banks often say, quote unquote, I mandate that if you're going to get your financing, you need a credit worthy commercial tenant. And that, of course, at least in my world in Manhattan, has the world chain store attached to it, not in the necessarily um, in the actual uh, statement, or but it does hint that. So those are just some of the ways that we're trying to address this problem. Um, I do I want to thank you, like everyone else, for your work on the commercial rent tax. That is a really important aspect to this discussion. will make a big difference for the businesses from uh, Chambers up to 96th Street. And I'm hoping that next year uh, we will work on uh, the uh, successor to intro 799A to remove the commercial rent tax from affordable supermarkets or just supermarkets that cater to the neighborhood. We all know the importance of supermarkets but they also have SNAP and WIC, which are important programs for people who are low income and need a healthy food for their family. Um, and so the whole CRT movement uh, led by you has been a huge way to fight commercial vacancy because if you have uh, the rent in the first place without the burden of CRT, you're going to keep your local store. So congratulations. Um, I do want to thank uh, the City Planning Commission because during the Bloomberg administration led by City Planning Commission, we built a, a special district, a zoning special district. I know, I think Barry's here. I don't know that um, anybody else is here from City Planning, but I really want to thank them. And by limiting a property owner's ability to combine small retail spaces into large frontages suited to either chains or bigger stores, that's when you cause a, lot, cause a loss of services to the community. And the reason that City Planning Commission, after three years of study, and it was three years of study, both Laura and Barry at City Planning were the wonderful authors of that study. And what we learned was because the West Side only has, as commercial avenues, Columbus, Amsterdam, and Broadway, whereas the East Side has York and, and uh, First Avenue, Second, Lex, and so on and so forth, Madison, we had so few avenues, we were able to make a, um, a case for the fact that we needed a limitation of 25 feet for banks along a 200-foot storefront uh, landscape and uh, about 40 feet, at least in Columbus and Amsterdam, for any new store. Obviously, those that are there stay. So I really was honored and pleased that in the report that was just released by the uh, City Council called Planning for Retail Diversity, I know there are a lot of good suggestions in there, but they, they meaning the City Council staff, did an analysis of my enhanced commercial district zoning 
and the report found that the rezoning was, quote, successful in stabilizing the number of storefronts on Amsterdam and Columbus Avenues and preventing the displacement of existing businesses for storefront mergers. It is also possible that the restrictions have helped contribute to a lower vacancy rate and a higher rate of business retention, unquote. Big deal for me because nobody has done that kind of analysis. And, of course, um, we all we need to continue to fight for similar protection throughout the city, but particularly Manhattan. And I think I mentioned earlier, it's the underlying data um, that got us to that law. It wasn't a willy-nilly anecdotal discussion, extremely extensive work by academics and city planning commission staff. So I think just to add to that, to understand the status and history of vacancies in an area requires hiring a private data firm or using city staff to conduct a comprehensive rent survey and an analysis that will necessitate many hours of time, not unfamiliar to all of us who are here today. Thank you. Somebody found some glasses. That's great. Thank you. Another pair. I really need them. <laughs> no, they're not mine, but they'll do. <laughs> I do. I have a whole bunch collection now. Um, so during the summer of 2017, we worked with New Yorkers and interns and staff, and we looked at the issue of commercial vacancy. We only were able to do it on one avenue, but we went from the bottom of Broadway all the way to the top and inward, and we found that there are 188 empty storefronts. And of course, we need that kind of data citywide. I will add, because we're all talking about our commercial storefront slash campaign headquarters, and mine was on 96 and Broadway. That was four years ago. It's still vacant. So I think that it's interesting that Council Member Kostowitz was hers was in, uh, vacant for nine years. Same problem. So this Broadway exercise was really useful in capturing the northernmost and southernmost extremes of the issues in Manhattan. Um, and it, it and it's uh, but and then to the credit of Council Member Rosenthal, she did a similar study on the Upper West Side. Civitas, as the Council Member knows, has canvassed East Harlem and the Upper East Side. But this is the problem: these surveys occurred at different time frames with different metrics, and they all have a different patchwork of data. And that's the problem: we need to have something that is apples to apples. Um, I testified in September of 2016 on September 15th before the Housing and Buildings Committee to discuss pending legislation to establish a better accounting system for vacant land and buildings. And I urge members of that committee to incorporate a number of changes, most importantly, to break out the number of vacant commercial retail units from other types of vacancies because we are currently not able to accurately understand the magnitude of commercial vacancies on a citywide basis which is what you have heard over and over again today. As the initiator, I'm the passer of the city's municipal open data portal. I know a little about the importance of timely, accurate data. And I am certain that if we provide a data set about commercial vacancy that is freely available, open source, we will enlist the support of academia and civic hackers and advocates in government and small business owners themselves. This database will be populated with revised data when a commercial landlord has a tenant a retail unit that becomes untenanted for a number of months. For example, the property owner would be required to report the space as vacant to the city of New York. The owner would also report when a new lease is signed for the vacant space or when a new business begins using the space. And I look forward to working with Councilmember Rosenthal and others on this legislative initiative. We need better data in large quantities to truly wrap our arms around the question of how, where, and when government policy or market forces create commercial zones populated with empty storefronts, which is exactly what you said, Mr. Chair, as what the issues are. This committee will hear many excellent ideas here today. I'm very partial to Ken Adams, who's sitting in the back here. Um, who's been in the economic development field for years, and if I listen to him, I always go with Ken Adams. I just want to let you know. But unless we quantify the problem before, during, and after, we attempt to enact a solution. How will we be able to assess our success 
and how to best proceed in combating commercial vacancy in our neighborhoods. So the bottom line is we really need the data and we need the agencies to help us gather it. And I thank you very much for this opportunity on a topic that I feel very passionate about and I appreciate that the hearing is being held today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you on the, on the commercial rent tax and so many other, uh, so many other things. I wanted to just follow up with you on a couple of the points that you made because uh, um, uh, on your uh, 188 empty storefronts, but also the co-op and condo point. So tell us a little bit more about this federal law change. So it used to be that 80% of the revenue had to come from, from the shareholders. shareholders of the building. And the change... It's about five or six years ago, maybe more. Now allows... 100% can come from outside sources. It can come from a commercial tenant. Where there is a commercial tenant, not every co-op has a commercial tenant. So if you're, if you're a co-op with a potential for a commercial tenant, um, you would think there would be a high level of um, uh, desire to make sure that any space is yeah. rented. Yeah, I mean, it depends. As you know, many times the sponsors hold on to the commercial, so that would be a different situation. Everything, every instance is different, but that law had some impact, and of course, it's not going to change because we all have, um, but it, it's just part of the puzzle. We all have constituents who are shareholders, and I can understand because when you are on the board, you have a fiduciary responsibility, right, to make sure that the maintenance stays low and the roof gets fixed. So if I'm a shareholder of a co-op building and I have a vacant commercial space, in a situation where 100% of my uh, building's maintenance can be paid for by the revenue generated from that commercial space. You can space. do that, yes. I, I'm, as I understand, I'm basically in the same situation as any other mm -hmm. landlord out there. Mm -hmm. But these spaces are staying vacant forever. I mean, not I, forever. They're I, being I vacant for years. So when your conversations with, with business owners or, or property owners, were you able to get any nuggets of... Uh, the reason why that is happening or why rents have not come down or why the spaces are not being occupied by businesses that are not subject to uh, the challenges of e-commerce, et cetera. Right. Well, there are two things. When I have talked to some owners, to their credit, they are looking for tenants who will not be susceptible to a lot of the online. Obviously, restaurants, you're not going to order from uh, a foreign country a hamburger, I assume. You might use Seamless or some other food box, but you're not going to. So they look for restaurants. They look for places that are, um, I know one example, he's got, uh, you can go in there and get your shades and your curtains, and you have to go to the department, and you check it out, and you come back. So he, he looked for small businesses that are not going to be uh, have customers who order online because he figures they'll be there for a long time. Um, the other situation is I have owners who have large spaces. They do not want to carve them up. They do not because they say that the smaller tenants, commercial tenants, don't pay the rent. And so they want somebody who's going to pay the rent. And they're convinced that only a national uh, retailer will continue to pay the rent. So sometimes they stay vacant, that's what I hear, until they find that uh, creditworthy tenant who's larger than whatever was there locally. And I hear that over and over again. I know for a fact, because I have contacted and have a letter from the State Department of Taxation in New York, they don't get any kind of a write-off for having a vacant store. It is simply waiting for the larger rent. Um, as I think City Planning Commission knows, um, I've had many people come to me in the Upper West Side, owners saying, Gail, can you give me a variance? Can you give me a, a way out on my you know, 40 feet and my 25? Of course, I say no. But, you know, they, they don't want to break it up. I don't have, um, I think in many of the co-ops, they do rent. I mean, I think they work at it because they would like to have the revenue. So maybe there isn't, uh, most of the co-ops are rented, but they do have this new advantage. So you make an important point because you and I hear this all the time. Is there some sort of a benefit that somebody is getting for leaving the storefront no. vacant? Uh, in reality, that is not the case, is correct? The case. Is correct. Uh, in fact, uh, as I understand it, uh, there is some uh, some of the assessment if, as a property owner uh, is um, is done based on the fact that your building is occupied. A percentage of it is attributed to an occupied space. So even if it's vacant, you're getting hit with the taxes 
as if it was partially occupied. Right. So uh, I think that's an, that's an important Very point. Very important because everybody I run into says, aren't they getting a tax break? And the answer is no. So is our message then to, uh, to building owners and banks uh, today, you know, it, it's time to, to get real about the environment that we are in and not just hang out and wait for – uh, the highest and, uh, you know, biggest chain store that you can find, but actually consider uh, filling those spaces today uh, so that perhaps the city will not uh, take extra steps to uh, to regulate or do other uh, other things that could perhaps I think that's a good ramp their style. I'm a little bit on the uh, stick side, and the, and the carrot doesn't always work. But I would love to have, I think we need to have a discussion with Rebney and others and RSA because I do know that even staff, because I've spoken to them, of those two organizations live in our neighborhoods and want the diversity. So it's not a them and us. I think this is a problem that we all need to work together to solve. I have no names, but people who are well known to all of us who work for these organizations and who want the grocery store and want the uh, bodega and want the uh, uh, shoe store to be in their neighborhood and they are seeing them disappear. So I, I think this is a, a topic that we can all work on together. But as you say, we have to have the data. We do not have this data. So if it's a stick that gets us the data, then we have to do that in the you know, least penalizing method possible. But that, without data, we're going to have a hard time coming up with, I think, solutions. I think that's a very fair point, and uh, it was clear in the exchange with SBS that we do lack uh, a lot of that data. So um, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you Madam very Borough much. President, Forever. and uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation thank you. with Ken, you, and thank Ken you for Adams. being here. Okay, yeah, we're going to get to him in a sec. Okay, but first we're going to bring Brian Paul of the City Council Land Use Division to talk about the report that was just uh, uh, issued today. Here he is. Welcome. See, I don't even know how to work these microphones. I'm usually over there. So thank you. Um, this is an unusual role. I work in the land use division, actually. But um, I did work on this report that we released today. So I'll kind of present. Give us the highlights. An expert witness, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so the report is a detailed analysis of the challenges faced by New York City's storefront business owners and a comprehensive set of recommendations to protect and promote retail businesses. And much of this content directly relates to this topic, um, economics of vacant storefronts. And I've submitted the full report for the record, but I'll try to run through the most brief relevant things um, that come out of it, because it is uh, pretty long. Um, okay, according to data from the economic census from 2002 to 2012, the overall number of retailers and restaurants in New York City grew by nearly 24 percent from 42,000 to 52,000. And this growth was driven, in our analysis, by the city's overall economic and demographic growth, expansion of chain stores into the New York City market during this time, and a tremendous growth in tourist spending from less than 20 billion annually to over 35 billion annually. And a lot of uh, the state estimates perhaps 40 percent of that spending goes right to retail and, and restaurants. So that that's a huge aspect of fueling the growth. But since in recent years, since 2013 or so, the retail m growth in New York City has really stalled out. And we believe this is from a combination of rapidly rising commercial rents, changing consumer habits, and the rapid rise of e-commerce, as has been discussed here. Unfortunately, as has been discussed at length, right now, in contrast to the wealth of data available on New York City's housing stock, there is no comprehensive source for information on storefront businesses. We know only from reports released by the real estate industry that in Manhattan, in the last 10 years, average retail asking rents have risen about 44 percent overall. Um, this varies by area to area. In Upper Manhattan, it's 49 percent. Downtown Manhattan, 59 percent. And in parts of Midtown, 86 percent. And these rents have risen most steeply on the most exclusive shopping corridors, the prime retail corridors. And as this increase has accelerated, so has the vacancy rate of many of these corridors. Again, according to data that we only have available to us from the real estate industry, more than 20 percent of retail storefronts are currently sitting vacant in prime Manhattan neighborhoods 
including Madison Avenue, Fifth Avenue, Times Square, Herald Square, Soho, the Meatpacking District, and other recent reports have shown widespread vacancies on streets like Bleecker Street in the West Village and Broadway in Morningside Heights. But for the rest of the city, data on storefront rents and vacancies is not readily available. We hear only scattered reports from business improvements districts or local planning studies that vacancies appear to be a growing issue in many outer borough neighborhoods. In our research, we have found there are really three distinct variants of the storefront vacancy problem. High rent blight in neighborhoods with the highest real estate values, speculative warehousing in gentrifying neighborhoods with increasing property values, and neglect in neighborhoods where retail rents may still not be high enough to justify investment. High rent blight is a specific condition to neighborhoods with the highest real estate values, such as many parts of Manhattan. For some individual businesses, reported rent increases coming off 10-year leases are as much as 200 to 300 percent. For many neighborhood retailers and restaurants, these are shocking increases that can be impossible to absorb. And of those businesses that do choose to close, the vast majority shut down entirely rather than move to another location. A recent study found that 85 to 90 percent of businesses that shut down in New York City never reopen in a new location. With the prior tenant displaced by the rent increase, high rent blight sets in when the property owner is unable to find a tenant at the desired rate. Commercial brokers believe that this speculation to hold out for a big number is the main driver of vacancy in high rent areas. Many recent investors have paid extremely high prices based on a limited number of high profile leases and are looking to achieve comparable rents. In some cases, property owners have received financing from banks that only pencils out if the very high rent is secured, which is why they keep waiting for that rent. But the number of retail tenants that can afford that is these high rents are limited. With vacancy rates in many neighborhoods climbing over 20 percent, these tenants may be in short supply. And some real estate industry observers are warning of a retail bubble in, in Manhattan specifically. The second kind um, a vacant storefront is the, the neighborhood with the rapidly increasing property values. And uh, studies have found that storefronts in these neighborhoods tend to remain empty for longer on average than in other neighborhoods. And at our a different hearing we had last year, representatives from the North Flatbush bid described this pattern uh, as owners finding it more advantageous to hold out on leasing spaces as they warehouse available property for future opportunity rather than leasing to local entrepreneurs. And then there are neighborhoods um, such as Far Rockaway that we heard about where retail rents may not be high enough to justify investment. Landlords often expect the business to cover the cost of renovations and fit out of space. And if a storefront has deteriorated for many years of vacancy, this upfront cost can be a challenge. And there are numerous other potential explanations for vacant storefront that may not be connected to rent directly, such as absentee ownership, disputes over ownership, and there is sometimes a normal vacancy cycle where people are just trying to find the right tenant. And we should, we need much more research on this. Um, compounding the real estate and tax issues, the accelerating growth of internet shopping is threatening to disrupt the real estate, the uh, retail industry from coast to coast. According to uh, data from the federal government, from, since 2006, e-commerce spending in the United States has risen from 3% of all retail spending to nearly 10% and has increased nearly 16% year over year. And this combination of rising rents and the increasing competition from e-commerce is increasingly toxic for New York City retailers. The owner of a uh, hardware store on Broadway in the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side that recently closed said, you cannot pay Broadway rent and be the cheapest and compete with, business, with stores on Amazon. So the report today uh, released includes a comprehensive set of 20 recommendations but I'll just um, quickly summarize five of the most relevant ones to the vacancy issue. Number one, require storefront vacancy reporting. The council and administration could begin to address the problem of vacant storefronts by requiring landlords to register with SBS after a storefront has been vacant for 90 days and report on the status 90 days, uh, every 90 days thereafter. And as we've heard, we really do not have any citywide data on storefront vacancies. And this, this would start to solve that problem and once, if the data does uh, demonstrate that this is, a, this is a barrier to retail diversity in our neighborhoods, then potentially some kind of disincentive or incentive program could be the next step. Um, 
again on the subject of data, the administration could collect and analyze storefront retail data in every community district as part of a citywide commercial district needs assessment. So SBS already does these studies in certain neighborhoods where they, they analyze the retail corridor and tell you, talk to you about the number of storefronts, vacancy rates, types of stores, conditions of storefronts. Um, these could be done citywide in every neighborhood from time to time. That would require uh, more resources, I'm sure, but it's something that would be a way to, to get citywide data on the retail market that we don't have. Um, three, study the impact of the growth of e-commerce on the brick and mortar retail sector and develop additional policies and programs to help small businesses adapt. This is uh, really a huge and growing issue and it's not something that um, this city and I don't think many cities across the country have really tried to grapple with. So this, we think this is worthy of a, of a real serious study to develop recommendations to help mitigate the impact on small businesses. Uh, number four, help nonprofits develop affordable commercial spaces in underserved areas. This is especially for neighborhoods that remain underserved by retail, with um, perhaps with the long-standing vacancies you heard about in Queens as an example of that, where SBS could increase the capacity of local community organizations as partners in economic development and develop innovative programs to help local community developers redevelop vacant or underutilized commercial space. And finally, there are um, there may be opportunities for the council and administration to create new, stronger tools to incentivize commercial affordability. Uh, potentially, this might include a tax abatement to incentivize affordable long-term leases, which would most likely require state authorization when we're talking about that, or a direct subsidy program on the model um, of one we've seen in San Francisco called the Legacy Business Fund that provides ongoing annual subsidy for both the business and the landlord if an agreement on a long-term affordable lease is reached. Um, the city is already doing a similar direct subsidy program with the Love Your Local. We heard about this is potentially um, a way to strengthen that framework and, and bring the landlord into the program as well. And yep, that's the summary. Terrific. Great summary. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we appreciate uh, the work that you put into this report. Obviously, uh, it's really going to help um, uh, to shape the discussion going forward, so we thank you. Um, I'm going to spare you from uh, questions, but I appreciate your being here to explain what was exactly that the, uh, that you put together. So we appreciate your being here. Um, next, we're going to bring up uh, Lena Afridi of NHD, Ken Adams of uh, Bronx Community College, CUNY, uh, Justin Levinson of Vacant New York, and Avi Leshes of the Brooklyn Chamber. Welcome, guys. Everybody will have three minutes. Go. Good. My name is Justin Levinson, and I worked on the Vacant New York project that uh, tallied and mapped empty storefronts in Manhattan. Um, I initially began investigating this as I saw the number of businesses leaving the neighborhood uh, without being replaced, as has been discussed before. I was curious initially as to how widespread the problem was based on my own sort of anecdotal evidence, and uh, I certainly felt that I was seeing an increase in for rent signs around my neighborhood and the ones that I worked and visited. Uh, as it turns out, problem is quite widespread. Uh, should not be news to anyone here. Uh, as of summer 2016, I'd recorded nearly a thousand vacancies in Manhattan uh, via a combination of online collection and hand counting. Uh, due to inaccuracies in the data gathering process, I definitely undercounted by a fair bit. Um, There's a very long tail of storefronts that are not represented by big brokers, which is where I received most of my data, and in neighborhoods that I had not gone personally to hand count, which is a big job. Um, I got more than 100 additional vacancies written in by readers, by people who'd found the site, uh, people who lived in the communities, and then Gail's office uh, did the Broadway hand count with more than 188 storefronts that they also located. There's some overlap, but there were quite a few that were not represented on my map. Um, although present across the borough, the distribution tended to be around higher rent districts, uh, with Soho in particular being quite hard hit. Uh, based on research and anecdotal evidence, uh, what appears to be happening is that 
Rental tenants are being presented with large increases in rent uh, when their lease comes up or they're not offered a renewal at all. Uh, vacating and then the property owners sit and wait to find a new tent who will pay whatever they're asking. Uh, for me, the most surprising finding wasn't actually the data. It was the fact that this acted as a lightning rod. I mean, I got, I'm still getting emails from people who are upset that a store is gone, um, that, you know, that their uh, business owner, that they lost you know, their, their own lease, or paradoxically, I'm getting emails from people who want to open a new business, a restaurant, a store, and cannot find a space at a price that they can afford. Um, for me, I mean, obviously there's no kind of silver bullet solution. Uh, if this was easy, we would have done it a while ago. Uh, monitoring is obviously a first important step. Um, the registry has been discussed, uh, vacant longer than a specific period of time, requiring people to register to at least have some idea of the impact of this um, across the city uh, would allow us to keep tabs on the problem. Uh, the second is prevention, and we have a thriving retail community in New York despite this trying to figure out how to stop the bleeding, you know, whatever solutions we put in place to incentivize people to occupy these spaces. If we continue to lose longstanding businesses at the rate we are, we're not gonna be able to replace them fast enough. Um, and then the third, obviously, is to fill the spaces that are vacant. Um, I, everyone wrote into me saying, oh, we should have pop-ups. Pop-ups are great, um, but they're a Band-Aid solution. Uh, what we really need is tenants who are going to invest in the community, people who are going to occupy a space in the community and um, not disappear in six months. And I think it's some kind of combination of carrots and sticks, um, matchmaking programs or penalties, uh, limiting frontage, you know, things on chain stores. I didn't know this report came out. Uh, I think a lot of these things are covered in there. And uh, it'll take some experimentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lena Fridi. I'm the Policy Coordinator for Equitable Economic Development at ANHD. It's the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Um, we're speaking as part of United for Small Business NYC. We're a coalition of community organizations all across the city fighting to support and protect New York City's small businesses from the threat of displacement with particular focus on owner-operated, low-income, minority, and immigrant-run businesses. ANHD and USB NYC support the City Council in examining the economic impact of vacant storefronts. We applaud the Council on releasing today's report, which examines the threats to New York City's small businesses, including the issue of vacancies. A core component of USB NYC's platform calls for the City to penalize and fine landlords who warehouse commercial properties for an extended period of time. Warehouse storefronts are, an unsight are unsightly and reduce foot traffic for existing small businesses, reduce available rental space for new small businesses, and act as a mechanism for speculation, especially in communities of color where landlords hold on to vacant spaces in order to wait for real estate prices to rise and rent the property to a newer and wealthier clientele. Currently, there's no mechanism in place to penalize property owners who neglect vacant properties or intentionally leave space vacant. This ultimately stacks a deck against the remain remaining businesses in neglected corridors. So I'm going to echo the points on data. Um, though no vacancy data exists, um, NHG did an analysis of DCA licenses on total and net change on in total businesses that have licenses, which revealed that Manhattan as a whole experienced a 2% loss in total businesses, with almost every single neighborhood seeing a decline in businesses that were operating. Um, so this doesn't include restaurants. If it included restaurants, it would be a much bigger hit. Um, in the outer boroughs, Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, which are both gentrifying very rapidly, each saw a 2% net loss in businesses, and Hunts Point actually had the highest net loss citywide at 6%. Um, this could be attributed to the epidemic of commercial warehousing or the process in which landlords hold onto property without renting it out in hopes that its rental value might rise. We're calling on the city to penalize and fa fine landlords for warehousing commercial properties for more than six months. Other municipalities have already implemented similar measures. In San Francisco, city law requires owners of any storefront left vacant for more than 270 days to pay $765 annually and importantly, register with the city. Um, vacant storefronts and the warehousing of commercial properties, a citywide issue in commercial corridors across the five boroughs, but it particularly impacts immigrant communities and c communities of color already facing displa displacement pressures. This, this issue is central to USB NYC's policy agenda and a fine on landlords that warehouse commercial properties is a core piece of our policy platform. Once again, the council applauds the council, uh, the coalition applauds the council for holding this oversight hearing and urges the council to take meaningful steps to curb storefront vacancies. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you on addressing this challenge and others that impact New York City's small businesses. Let's see if we can get the good afternoon. Chairman Gorodnik, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, 
and thank you to other members of, of the committee and everyone else who's here providing testimony this afternoon, and especially my friend, obviously my friend Gail Brewer. Uh, the, um, I think I earned this invitation uh, to participate as a result of an op-ed piece I had in the Daily News earlier this week, and uh, it might be a case, and it, uh, the point of my being here then would be to elaborate on that a bit and just to say what I want to bring to the discussion is consideration of the people themselves, uh, the merchants, the people that we need to identify and support and hope will be the next uh, series of successful independent retail entrepreneurs all across the city. My big concern is it's like the mom and pops aren't having any kids. Uh, and what are we going to do to get more people to actually look at these oppor business opportunities and get support from uh, policies uh, and uh, organizations like those at this table with me that can be helpful? So three or four things to consider. The point I was trying to make in the piece earlier this week is that just to be mindful of the context of the what I call the layering effect of excessive federal, state, and city rules and regulations that these individuals who we're here to support have to go through. Now, we all know this is real, and improvement's been made, but we have to be mindful of these conditions. I cite in that piece, for example, to open a bookstore, a dry use that would be amenable to many property owners. There are 15 agencies, federal, state, and city, at a minimum one must to consult, restaurant or bars or other things, obviously much more. And that enforcement at the end of that is also something we hear a lot, I hear a lot about from merchants. And my role, I didn't introduce myself, I apologize, but at, I'm the Dean of Economic Development and um, at, uh, at uh, Bronx Community College, and I work a lot with Burnside Avenue merchants, and I'm working on the Jerome Avenue rezoning on some of these issues. A couple other things to consider then, uh, again, about the context and about the, and it's been well, I think, uh, discussed today, but this layering effect certainly includes the broader issues of the effect of online retail and let's not forget the big box stores, which 10, 15 years ago in this city and in this body, we were looking at zoning changes to enable big box. So that neighborhood hardware store also has a Home Depot not far away. Um, so they've got, if you think about the struggles here, um, brought on by just competitive economics, right, big box retail, online retail, uh, and then, of course, the rising rents, which just can be the icing uh, on the cake we see where um, this is just becoming really, really hard. Of the various proposals kicked around this afternoon, I'd like to add a couple ideas, or to them I'd like to add a couple of ideas in my final seconds here. One is the notion of something like the old ICIP program. In other words, an incentive program, this, we, we need folks at the Department of Finance to think about this, but could, what happens if I own a building and instead of taking a market rent, I'm willing to, um, preserve the tenant that's there that's an independent mom-and-top bookstore or restaurant or retailer, uh, but I'm, I'm going to sacrifice a certain amount against the market rent by renewing lease for 10 years at the, at the existing rent. Um, could I get a tax credit against my property taxes that makes up for that difference to some degree, to somehow make me whole? Would that incentive work? Would it, it's always better if I can renew a lease and not have to have a – assuming I want to keep a tenant and I want to make rent – um, the pain of having to lease a space and go through a new tenant and maybe find a new use. So, you know, is there some way that there be, could be something done to the AV of that property because now it's adjusted because the tenant is on a lease of a certain length to a qualifying individual, you know, independent retailer, this wouldn't be for a chain, um, for a certain period of time uh, at a below, at a less than market rent? Can I adjust down my AV and actually get a discount on my property tax or get a refundable tax credit or a credit I could apply if I own other properties? Um, the other issue, again, we used to, and we, when I was at the, my friend here from the Brooklyn Chamber is going to speak in a second, but in my tenure at the Brooklyn Chamber, we did a lot of this on Fulton Street and Fort Greene, and we looked at the question of what can we do to help people who rent become their own landlords? What can we do to help the, ex the current mom and pops as a city buy their property through a commercial condo or co-op or actually buying the building if it's a multi-story building. Uh, and maybe there's more that we could do in that regard in terms of low-cost financing and other technical assistance to do, I mean, at, at scale. The other is, where does the final thing, w when the city controls the development of new property, particularly think about all the affordable housing that the city is creating uh, and the retail spaces in buildings that are uh, financed through HPD or through the state agencies, uh, when, when the city – when there's an exercise of government tax credits uh, or other support in the, for a developer of affordable housing, to what degree can we create the retail opportunities in those mixed-use buildings, the ground floor retail, to meet certain conditions that we, again, is, think are important, like preserving the neighborhood independent retailers as opposed to national chains uh, becoming the tenants for these developers of affordable housing? 
Um, again, they're just situations where if the city has some involvement, obviously through a zoning action or through the financing of affordable housing, multi, you know, uh, a mixed-use building, if the city has some intervention, doesn't that give it an opportunity? Does it give us the opportunity to say, who do we re ideally who would be great for neighborhood quality of life and local economic impact in that space? And how can we piece something together to help make that happen? Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Garonik, members of the committee. My name is Avi Leshes. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. Um, as the Chamber of Brooklyn, we're the largest chamber both in New York City and New York State. In 2017, our member issue survey revealed that the number one issue cited by our members was the displacement of small businesses. The negative impact displacement not only affects business owners, but it also impacts families of the local community as a whole. Um, furthermore, our membership provided a number of suggestions about reducing displacement, which range from buy local campaigns to incentivize for landlords, just like I just mentioned, to provide long-term leases. Therefore, we join our members in making these specific recommendations to help reduce the negative economic impact of vacant storefronts. Creating a commercial zoning protections, inclusionary housing has provided to be an effective tool in aligning affordable housing needs to the development community. It is time that we consider some of the some sort of creative techniques to align interests of our mom and pop and retail development community. Another idea was floated was no vacancy incentives to let us consider ways to reward property owners to maintain occupied storefront retail and limit turnaround time between tenants. It is critical that we incentivize owners to keep the storefronts occupied. Another idea was to expand the buy local campaign, which you heard from SBS. The Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce is a strong advocate for supporting local industries. We have a Brooklyn Made Certificate Program, which helps organize marketing and promotion opportunities for local makers and to connect Brooklyn Made products with the business opportunities of expansion of these programs outside of New York. And one of the things that they also mentioned about talking about data, we know that Chamber on the Go, as the Brooklyn Chamber has done this in our borough, it's a very easy program. They go door to door, they're using the commercial quarters. That's another way of avenue if you want to collect data of vacant storefronts to tap into the Chamber on the Go program to say, hey, can you guys collect data of vacancies of the businesses and quarters you're meeting? So we must incentivize retailers to properly owner and owners to work together. This will require a thoughtful and proactive approach. It will be challenging to tackle these issues surrounding vacant storefronts, and we hope to exchange ideas with you and the other city council members that we move toward these solutions. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. Um, first, I just wanted to um, make a comment, and then I just have a, a general question. Uh, the comment on a vacant uh, on vacant NYC. Thank you. It's a really interesting site and um, and helpful, and I think really illustrative of the problem that we're facing. Um, and it also identifies one of the reasons why somebody might keep uh, a space vacant, uh, even if the market forces might have suggested otherwise. And that was if if you have a whole portfolio of properties and uh, taking a hit on one is not just a hit on one. It sort of resets the market in a way that could have a very harmful effect on all the rest of your spaces. I think you make that point on the website, and I think that's a very good point. Um, so now I want to talk about the, the carrot or stick question, because we've got a, we had a stick suggestion and we had a carrot suggestion. Uh, the stick being penalizing for vacancies, which is, on one hand, appealing because why should they be vacant for all that time? They're causing harm to, to neighborhoods. On the other hand, uh, maybe they're being kept vacant because they can't find somebody to occupy the space as the sort of the counterpoint. And the carrot, well, maybe there's ways to create an incentive for somebody to take a below market rent, uh, which has the appeal of not being uh, punitive, but uh, it gives somebody a chance to do something good with the city's help. On the other hand, should we be, you know, should we be interfering in, uh, in those lease negotiations in that way? Are we going too far with the hand of government? So anyway, I want to just pose the question to anybody about the thought of the carrot versus uh, stick approach, whether they should be dealt with mutually exclusively or um, if one works, one doesn't. I just want to pose it more generally to everybody and see what you have to say on that stuff, subject. So I, I have some thoughts on this. Um, so... USBNYC and NHD both recognize that not all landlords are the same. We come across this, you know, all the time. We came across in the commercial tenant anti-harassment legislation as well. Um, different landlords have different needs. They have different ways of dealing with different tenants. Um, what we need to consider is if it if it's a huge landlord 
that owns multiple properties, they need to be dealt with differently than if it's a small scale landlord who owns maybe one one property with residential on top. You know, if it's like a mixed use building with three units on top and commercial at the bottom, it's very different than somebody who owns um, a portfolio of 15 properties, huge large scale properties in Manhattan. Um, so I think that the carrot or stick option really depends on who the landlord is and that is really up to um, the administration and the council to decide what makes the most sense. And of course, NHD and USBNYC are happy to help with that. You know, just, uh, I guess I'm coming back to the carrot, Mr. Chair. Uh, but the, one of the, pro one of the problems, that's, and probably pretty distinct to the New York City real estate market, is just this incredibly inflated, well, really huge increase in residential values so that in a mixed-use building, I mean, you see situations certainly in Brooklyn and around the boroughs where someone will buy a mixed-use building not for the commercial space but because of the value or the potential upside value of the residential above it. Uh, and it was said quite eloquently by a prior speaker this afternoon that then that transaction may have a whole lot of expenses or costs to it and financing costs that are contingent on on a lease, and I'm not being sympathetic here, if someone is making an investment taking that risk. But again, I think what needs further study, and I don't want everyone else seems to be talking about more studies and more data, but I think a tricky question is, in a market where the residential portion of a piece of property is really, really valuable, and it's had just this trajectory of increasing value, um, that's gonna, that has to drag the commercial space affiliated with it up at the same time, right? Putting that pressure, sort of an obvious point. Um, and so is there a way to kind of unhook those two or disconnect those two in, in, val in the sense of the, the change in value from an appraisal standpoint or from a financing standpoint? But th because that's what, you know, you see people pay for, let's say, uh, as you just pointed out, a three or four story building, right, mixed use building with a 20 foot, so f by 4,800 square foot storefront and then maybe three apartments above. People these days will pay so much in certain areas of the city for that building simply for the residential capacity. They're not, you know, it's sort of inconsequential downstairs. Um, and probably they could, they can't, but if they could convert the downstairs to an apartment, they would in certain neighborhoods. Um, and so that's one of the unique kind of features of New York City real estate that's creating some of this problem. And I, that is something I think we could look at a little further. I think there's the there's a sense certainly that you know a neighborhood increases in value and then as a business continues as they renew a lease like things get more expensive for me the the yeah. idea of having some sort of guardrail on what's reasonable increase and what is unreasonable increase whether that's you know being forced to at least come to the table and offer a lease renewal um, to have some kind of cap on percentage or an arbitration mediation some sort of s way to say yes we understand this is more expensive but we need to say, you know, there's a reasonable limit to that. That sort of, st again, stopping the bleeding of the businesses that we have already before we go and look at new solutions to fill in these vacant properties will help to reduce the overall number and, again, as you pointed out, afford people opportunities, a space where they can come in and say, I want to try something. All right. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, you had real insight to this conversation. We appreciate you being here, so thank you. Um, and we're going to call our last uh, last panel of the day. It's actually going to be a five-person panel, so we'll add a chair. Uh, Ty Beatty of Brooklyn Community Board 6, uh, Christine Lynch of Local Color NYC, um, Victoria Heyman, Joanna Colley of, Carne of Carnegie Hill Neighbors, and uh, Robert Joseph of the Municipal Arts Society. So welcome to all of you and Welcome. You wanna you wanna start to Okay, there we go. Good. Okay. Right. Um hi, my name is Victoria Hagman. I'm a resident of Brooklyn, um, in Red Hook. I am a member of community board six. I have a master's in historic preservation and planning from Pratt, and I'm a real estate broker. 
And it was infuriating to hear SBS speak earlier about the lack of data, because there's data available. Um, they have access to it, and they're not utilizing it. It was upsetting for me. I was going to read this case study I pulled together in two or three hours last night about what's happening in downtown Brooklyn, um, but there is access to resources. Um, maybe I will read this. But the, I would say that everybody here is saying talk about how we collect data about vacancies. You just need to collect data about rents and commercial rents and residential rents. There's no reason there can't be a system for it when people are filing their taxes. Like, it could be really simple, and we don't need to overthink this, but there should be a platform for people to um, collect the, that information and not just focusing on vacancies. Um, so I will just read this case study that I did in a very short amount of time about um, downtown Brooklyn. Um, the empty storefront epidemic that plagues Smith Street and Atlantic Avenue and many other parts of Brooklyn has a large impact on the economic and social fabrics of the local community. Um, this problem has been developing over the last decade and a half. We, are, we have been experiencing the worst vacancy rates since the beginning of this problem. The price per square foot in this, these areas um, over the last decade has doubled and in some cases tripled for retail spaces on main uh, retail corridors. The price increases was triggered by a large amount of new development happening in the area and creating available spaces for large chain retailers. Large scale new developments from real estate developers throughout the area could be directly tied to the Atlantic Yards Forest, Re Forest City Ratner project that started in 2004 and the rezoning of downtown Brooklyn also in the same year. Since those events transpired, developers have bought and held um, property and kept retail storefronts vacant as part of their business model. Um, this was not the case previously because small property owners could not afford to leave storefronts vacant without rental income and afford the cost of holding the property. Um, storefronts have historically had higher rental prices than residential, in, in, than residential units. The exchange of property in the area also drove up taxes that encouraged small property owners to sell to these large development corporations. These large real estate development corporations' business model is built on speculation, driving up prices and instigating zoning changes for their benefit alone without investment or, be or benefit to the local community. A prime example of this is Thor Equities, which is currently has vacancies in all of their properties in Brooklyn, um, besides the most newly acquired one that came with existing leases. Uh, I printed out a picture of all of their, and that's from Google from this summer, that th and they are all still empty. Um, and all of the list of all the properties that they own. Um, these are currently over 203 retail spaces available in the downtown Brooklyn vicinity. There's a large demand for these spaces that are currently available. But at these rents, small businesses are unable to create a business model that can compete with large chain stores who are willing to pay more. Many cities like San Francisco started addressing these issues 13 years ago. It goes on. Um, th okay, 13 years ago when they passed their formula retail policy. We are coming up on 10 years since Trader Joe's opened its first location at 130 Court Street. A plethora of other large chain realtors have moved into the area using these spaces as part of their marketing campaigns without having to reach return or profit benchmarks. This brick and mortar marketing strategy has also drove up prices, but as e-commerce takes over the consumer market, many places are closing or choosing to spend their advertising budgets in other ways. Um, it is the responsibility of the city government to find solutions for these issues because these actions have been triggered by city policies from neighborhood-wide to spot rezonings, targeted investment like Atlantic Yard's administrative mandate to build new housing and other policies that have bolstered the inequity in our business community. I encourage city council to look into and find tools that disincentivize vacancies and create legislation that will establish economic health of our neighborhoods. And I have tons of great ideas about how you can do this, but we can do that another time. Thank you, Chair Grodnick. Uh, I'm Ty Beatty. I'm the Acting District Manager at Brooklyn Community Board 6. Um, I want to congratulate Chair Grodnick. I worked with your office quite a bit when I was at Manhattan Community Board 5, so congratulations on the end of your, te your term. Um, the scourge of empty storefronts uh, plague our community, uh, Brooklyn Community Board 6, just as it does many neighborhoods throughout the city. Brooklyn Community Board 6 is comprised of vibrant, diverse neighborhoods that are vastly different from each other in look, feel, zoning, and built environment, but that still allows for linkages and transitions among them. As a whole, they reflect what makes this city as exciting as it has always. From the industrial heritage of Red Hook and Gowanus to the low scale, but still evolving milieus of Park Slope, Carroll Gardens, and Cobble Hill. Despite our vibrancy, from the Hook to Columbia Waterfront, from Smith to Court, and Fifth to Seventh Avenues, our commercial strips are often filled with as many empty storefronts 
as those that are open for business. The board has not performed an extensive economic study on the reasons behind these pockets of blight, but even the most casual observation of societal changes in real estate suggests a few options. As has been stated here numerous times today, we're becoming an e-commerce society. While it would be easy to blame the problem solely on the shift in how we buy goods, we must also consider the undeniable fact that landlords are overcharging for ground floor retail spaces. The periodic opening and closing of locations along our commercial corridors is easier to predict than seasonal weather patterns. In essence, fall brings a new crop of storefronts and winter brings the shuttering of their doors. To borrow a phrase from a past mayoral candidate, the rents are too damn high. We would like to ask the City Council to call upon the Department of City Planning to convene a citywide working group that would be tasked with examining creative land use and zoning means to protect smaller businesses from overzealous landlords and looking into commercial rent regulations and other outside-of-the-box responses to this issue, including looking into fines for extreme vacancy, incentives to lease spaces, and coordination between property owners and small business services to help in space matching. Far too often, we hear about one project or another destroying the fabric of our community as if our communities were inherently weak when, in fact, our neighborhoods are being destroyed in some part, not because of this weakness, but because of the intractable, intractable blight that occupies box after box of empty storefront. We want commercial success that is not based upon the need to have only Starbucks, Chipotle, and CVSs of the world. Brooklyn and New York City as a whole is not based upon big box retailers. It's based upon the diversity of our stores and storekeepers, the celebration of our cultures, and the joy of walking down the street and seeing thriving businesses. You have community, Brooklyn Community Board 6's uh, commitment to hold public meetings to discuss the options that come from, the, from this working group we've requested, and we pledge our willingness to listen to new ideas. And once again, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Gorodnik and the entire Economic Development Committee. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Christine Lynch, and I'm here to talk about opportunities for small businesses in New York City. I own a company called Local Color NYC, and I source and sell local and American-made goods. I started the company in 2015. Initially, I hoped to open a brick-and-mortar store, but quickly found that this was impossible. Rents were extremely high, and landlords were demanding three years of tax returns and at least four months of rent up front. I looked at websites that advertise temporary pop-up spaces for rent, which sounds like the perfect opportunity for startups, but that is not the case. Prices are inflated with rents of one garment rack in a store being advertised for $3,000 a month. I decided to do something unconventional and create my own opportunity. I built my shop into a truck and created a mobile boutique, but these past, two, but these past two years have not been easy. My business has been stymied by the city at almost every turn. Under New York City law, it is illegal to vend goods out of a vehicle, a law that has not been updated for about 30 years. I have been arrested by the police and harassed by the high power big money bids. Last year, I applied through the street activity permit office to park in a public plaza. I was invoiced $150,000 for 30 days, but would, but would not be allowed to vend. These permits are really just for large corporate, pr corporate promotional events, they explained. I then went to the DOT to inquire how to vend in the plazas. I was told that vending was allowed, but only through movable but not mobile structures. Uh, there are two separate organizations governing the same plazas with completely different sets of rules, which negate my mobile boutique from operating in a public plaza. This fall, I found an indoor space to rent at the Broadway Market in Soho. I pay $3,500 a month for just 60 square feet of space. Now my business is at risk again because myself and 40 other small businesses will be evicted at the end of the year to make room for TJ Maxx. There is a crisis in commercial rents in New York City. The city could do so much more to punish owners of vacant spaces and allow for alternatives to high-priced brick-and-mortar storefronts. Um, I have a lot more information in my printed testimony. I also included the $150,000 invoice from Sapo, and I also have um, two uh, proposals for a mobile retail in New York City to create opportunities for startups. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joanna Cauley, and I want to say thank you so much, Chairman Grodnick, for asking me to speak. And our organization, Carnegie Hill Neighbors, is so grateful to you for all your work. 
over the many years you've served the community. So thank you. Um, as I said, I, uh, I'm here today to, well, I'm here to speak about um, this retail vacancy rate um, in our neighborhood. I serve as executive director of Carnegie Hill Neighbors, and uh, we are a benchmark Upper East Side neighborhood. Um, since 1970, Carnegie Hill Neighbors' mission has been to preserve, protect, and improve our community. And the area spans from 86th to, 96th to 98th streets, from the east side of Fifth Avenue up to Third Avenue. Um, we run purpose-driven safety and beautification pro pro programs made possible through public and private funding and a new East Harlem Outreach Partnership begun this fall. We advocate for a residential classification by enforcing height limits, uh, the zoning resolution, and preservation of individual landmarks and groupings of buildings within our historic district. And I'd like to submit that a varied mix of storefront businesses with retail choice and professional services is good for Carnegie Hill and all of New York City. The historic neighborhood um, that we encompass houses several religious and cultural destinations for residents to vi residents and visitors to frequent and an active commercial landscape not only generates retail income for themselves and those other institutions in the area but formulates a cultural capital pulling pedestrians to shop on the high street and stay in the neighborhood thus pushing the era the area hopefully to a full residential capacity most Carnegie Hill buildings are co-ops. They own their retail storefronts and look for top dollar on rental agreements. And the few Carnegie Hill condo buildings have individually owned retail space and are often held by real estate syndicates that lever one space off another. A good mix of tenants can be made in the best case, but in the worst case, vacancies linger longer. Commonly, a corporate owner will prioritize a higher, longer lease over a thoughtfully planned retail landscape, leaving the door open to yet another bank or drugstore, and in other cases, local management will dev devote time and thought to a mix of two or three complementary tenants, delivering a vibrancy and diversity to the neighborhood, um, to the benefit of neighborhood foot traffic. In a survey completed by our Clean Streets team, Carnegie Hill hovers at the citywide average, which we found to be around 9%, and as also reported by Jonathan Hilberg in the Civitas Fall Report, um, Fall 2017 report. Um, this rate could easily be reduced given Carnegie Hill's fine, many fine characteristics, Wait, ways to recover health to our retail storefronts must include broad reform, and the New York commercial rent tax reform, thank you, is a good start but not enough. A compelling and multifaceted streetscape requires avowed assurances such as a landlord's pledge to lower rents for long-term success and stability. Um, recognize the city's obligation to protect store owners from vendor encroachment, oversight of store signage and awning regulations to make a diverse commercial landscape that follows a visual narrative, provisional tax abatements and or tax incentives to jumpstart small businesses, and lastly, municipal lines of support, like small business services, um, to circumnavigate the morass of big box stores and mass migration to online platforms. Um, vacant storefront space emboldens petty acts of crime and vandalism and contributes to urban decay with neglected, grimy streets seeing less foot traffic. Carnegie Hill is foremost in New York neighborhood to raise young families for teens to grow into their independence and for the elderly to age in place. An imaginative and comprehensive retail district is a vital building block of any successful neighborhood and the one place to satisfy our desire of being pedestrians and urban New Yorkers. And to the vendor, we've been toying with some ideas of creating spaces for vendors. That we may, we, for, you know, not for the smelly food carts, but we, we will we'll take your card. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Robert Joseph, and I'm a project manager at the Municipal Art Society of New York. The vacancy rate in some of our city's retail corridors is higher than 20%, or more than four times the vacancy rate expected in a healthy market. Although many different types of retail businesses have closed, the loss of small mom-and-pop businesses 
has the most profound effect on the character and social fabric of the neighborhoods experiencing this phenomenon. The uh, MAS applauds the New York City Council for its recent amendment to the commercial rent tax. Thank you, Chair Garodnik. More than 2,500 retail tenants are expected to benefit from the change in the applicability of this tax. We consider this amendment to be a crucial first step toward reducing the burden on small businesses in the heart of Manhattan. Furthermore, MAS enthusi enthusiastically supports the City Council's report, Planning for Retail Diversity, Supporting NYC's Neighborhood Businesses, released just today. Covering a range of topics from citywide planning to tax policy and financial incentives, the report outlines a comprehensive set of, re set of recommendations to improve economic health and retail diversity across the city. As the focus of today's hearing is on the economic impact of vacant storefronts, our comments will be limited to that concern. First, MAS considers the collection of additional information pertaining to retail vacancies and rents crucial to the creation of better policies to address the issue. We ask that the city collect detailed information regarding asking rents, current rents, and vacancies for retail spaces, as well as the duration of vacancies in retail spaces and other key site-specific data. MAS asks that such information be made publicly uh, accessible in usable formats such as maps, spreadsheets, and shapefiles to further advance outside study. The entire retail sector has faced substantial disruption uh, from online retailers, and the resulting impacts on New York City are yet to be fully understood. MAS also suggests that the Department of Small, Small Business Services take a more direct role in supporting smaller retailers and increasing the occupancy rates of ground floor spaces throughout the city. SBS should conduct an uh, investigation into other ways it can support retail establishments, including but not limited to lease negotiation, tax breaks, grant funding, and other financial incentives. MAS asks the city to consider ways to foster a friendlier business environment uh, for businesses in the physical sense. In some locations, obstructions such as scaffolding or sidewalk sheds have a significantly detrimental impact on retailers, especially on those that rely on foot traffic, leading to greater vacancy rates. The city can adopt measures such as Intro 1389-2016, introduced by Councilmember Ben Kalos. Finally, as a part of United for Small Business NYC coalition, led by uh, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, MAS is, a, is supportive of a set of recommendations that include penalizing landlords who intentionally warehouse commercial properties for more than six months, and the creation of an HPD-coordinated nonprofit commercial fund, uh, commercial development fund modeled on the nonprofit industrial development fund currently coordinated by the NYCDC. Retail spaces are a significant part of what makes New York City's neighborhoods vibrant and lively places to live, work, and spend leisure time. MAS believes that the loss of many small businesses and prolonged vacancy are a threat to the vitality of our city. As such, MAS urges the city to take action, utilizing our recommendations to support small businesses and retail corridors. We are confident that carefully considered measures can help mitigate the vacancy issues affecting much of the city. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this critically important issue. Terrific, and thanks to all of you. Um, I, I really, um, I, I wanted to pose a question uh, to Victoria on the subject of what's going on in Brooklyn as somebody who's a broker and seeing all sides of this. Uh, because what you described was vacancies that are vacant for a long time and also people who are looking for space. Okay, so what's, so when you try to put together the, 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 the entity or person that's looking to find the space and the people who have the space, um, what, is the, uh, what, what is the dynamic that you're seeing and what is the, you know, what's the impediment to their actually finding common ground? The rental amount is what the, I would say, the common factor for most scenarios. Um, landlords not willing to give build-out time. Landlords only wanting to give short leases because they're, especially in Gowanus, um, and neighborhoods that are prime for rezoning, they're waiting. They, and they don't want to commit to long, to long lease things, so people don't want to make capital investments. So if you're like, a, an, it's not a retail, but an industrial business that wants to make a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar investment in space, or a restaurant that's going to build out a space, you're not going to do that unless you have a 10-year lease. And landlords aren't willing to give a 10-year lease because they, uh, you know, that kind of commitment, of course, in Brooklyn actually didn't happen for a long amount of time unless you were in an, a historically industrial um, property. But restaurants, you know, people can sign one or two-year leases and then get taken advantage of. Um, what else? Okay. Sorry, um, now, the, 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 the owners mm -hmm. that are pushing hardest for shorter lease terms or have the highest demands for rent, um, in what percentage of the cases are they 
landlords for whom this is one of many of their properties. One of many of their properties. When I did a search yesterday to see um, how many spaces were available, then I could see which, what property owners own multiple properties through the data that is available, um, and they own more than one property. These, the turnover. When I did, a, when I went to Pratt, I did a, a, a study. Um, and it was something like 35% of the property had turned over in 10 years in Gowanus um, because of the implications that there was going to be a rezoning. This was before um, the Superfund um, had happened. So uh, the people, the, I lost my chain of thought, the amount of turnover in the actual properties has moved from small, t small single owner landlords to people that are uh, you know, we have crowdsourcing now, so you don't actually have to have the money to buy a whole building. You can invest in a portfolio where they buy multiple buildings for you. So they get to, and they also get to write off the loss of income on the, the storefront. So something like Thor Equity, they turned over a property at Bond Street. They bought it right before a rezoning at $6 million and sold it a couple years later for $70 million. So they have a profit margin. Oh, we're not collecting rents. Oh, well. I mean, it's, they're, they're not making their money off their rental income. They're pushing for, for a rezoning. And they okay, so that makes, that makes sense in the situation where some land use change could have you, mm -hmm. um, you know, yield a, a windfall situation. That's usually not going to be the case in most areas, right. but in the, in the areas where that is present, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, have we seen any overlay of the vacant spaces and the owners of those properties? Vacant NYC does not have that level of information, and you're not at the witness stand, so you're not officially answering, but you can say yes or no to me just so I can relay it to them. It, it doesn't, right? I mean, I've had brokers, right? It's just the owners. The actual owners. Okay. Because that actually, so if... You can do that, though, through Property Shark. If you go and you look up one building, and then you can just hit what other properties do they own, and it'll list all the okay. other properties. So what I, you know, what another thing that's coming out of the hearing here is if the one of the primary sources of the problem is not single building owner or uh, co-op building or whatever. Which we um, hardly have any of in our area. But it is uh, the the bigger real estate entities that may have a dozen or dozens of commercial spaces uh, that are holding off because they might be uh, setting the market, which could have a ripple effect across their, their whole portfolio. Well, that's worth our actually sorting out. And I'm saying this out loud to, you know, to committee counsel and also anybody listening um, as, the, as the term limited guy here. That, to me, is useful information because, um, you know, as we consider carrots, sticks, or making the observation of who is trying to market set to the detriment of our communities, that also is another tool that we have as advocates and public officials, and I think that that's worth our, our getting our hands on. Go ahead. And you can, there's one way for new development to resolve that by creating um, sort of limitations when you're going through ULERP, that if you have, go through a ULERP process, you have to then create small spaces, and you have to create affordable, instead of creating affordable housing, why aren't we creating affordable business spaces? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a really good point, and easiest done when there's a, a an approval that comes through here. In most cases, unfortunately, the, it's not coming through here for an approval, but yes, I think that's a really good point. Um, anybody else want to add anything on, on this before we close? No. Okay, well then I will say uh, I, I want to thank everybody who was here today to testify. This is obviously an important and complicated and continuing issue, and to the extent that uh, you know, people look to identify the one problem. I think that oversimplifies what is going on here. But I do think that we've uncovered a few tools, a couple of carrots, a couple of sticks, and maybe even a little bit of uh, transparency, which might impact this conversation going forward. So I thank everybody for being here. Uh, I thank uh, uh, members of the committee and staff. Thank you. And it has been a great privilege working with you guys, too. So thank you. And with that, we are adjourned.